number. Program signed. Okay, thank you. Uh, they declare the meeting of the Health Committee now open to the public online. And I'd like to welcome members who are participating by video conferencing today. And I'd also like to remind all members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. So uh, no apologies have been received today. We are aware uh, that the Deputy Chair may be a little late as a result of, of an incident. And um, is there any other apologies? No. no. Okay, thank you, members. So moving on then to chairperson's business members, um, we had a very significant engagement this week, an informal meeting with a range of groups from uh, cancer support services. Um, that was for me a very, very useful opportunity to explore some of the issues that that, that sector has faced. We recognize that there are many other conditions which have also been very, very badly impacted as a result of COVID, but cancer services and are clearly uh, among that among that group. Um, those those organisations that we were speaking to um, on Wednesday very often are bridging the gap between services and those who are in receipt of treatments, and they have clearly struggled in terms of engaging. They've struggled in terms of people being a uh, not able to avail of of diagnostics and treatment, and I think that. Uh, it was, it was an exceptional piece of work, I think, by the engagement team, I have to say, and I'd like to thank Louise and her team for, for putting it together. But I'd also like to thank Deirdre, Jonathan, uh, Deirdre and Jonathan from our own team for the work they did in pulling that event together. So is there any, any of the members who were at that meeting who would like to make any comment in relation to what we heard? Yes, go ahead, Jonathan. No, Chair, just to echo your comments, I felt it a very, very useful engagement session, and I think the way in which it was formatted helped members uh, to, to take a lot of information in in a short period of time, which is important given the, the serious interest there is around this and the number of people that actively want to engage with the committee. So I found that very useful, uh, and I think it's maybe a model going forward for a lot of these potential issues that we can uh, put aside, uh, whether it's a part of a day for something like that, to ensure that we get a, 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 a as broad a perspective uh, as to the issues facing a lot of these groups, and and you know now that we're emerging from COVID restrictions, etc., I can only imagine that um, our commitments to time in relation to the impacts that COVID has had on a plethora of these groups will only get uh, you know a, a more demanding in the times ahead. So it's important that we're as efficient as possible and allow us to hear as much information from as many stakeholders. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Jonathan. Okay, and would members be content, could be content to be right to the department highlighting some of the key points and concerns which were raised at yesterday's event? Are members content with that? Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, moving along then to the draft minutes. I refer you to the draft minutes of the meeting of the 25th of March at tab 3.1 of your pack. Are members content with those minutes? Yes, thank you, members. And there are no matters arising from those minutes today. So members, we're now going to move on to our first substantive briefing, which is a, a briefing from the Department of Health on Brexit issues. Uh, I refer members to your briefing paper there at tab 5.2 of the table papers and to the Hansard of the previous Brexit briefing, which is a tab five of your pack. I would now like to welcome to our meeting today, Ms. Cathy Harrison, who's Chief Pharmaceutical Officer are you able to hear us okay, Cathy? Yes, I can, Chair. Chair. Yes. Thank you, and we're hearing you loud and clear as well, Cathy. Thank you, Miss Emer Smith, who is Senior Principal Officer, EU Exit Transition Unit. Are you able to hear us okay, Emer? Yes, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Emer. And Miss Patricia Quinn Duffy, who is EU Exit Lead, Reciprocal Healthcare and Workforce Issues. Are you able to hear us okay, Patricia? I can indeed, Chair. Okay, well, to fault your over leg, you're all very welcome back to our committee. I know this has been an ongoing engagement, and, and we, we do appreciate that. Um, and we're looking forward to hearing your briefing this morning and then to in, engaging with members uh, in some questions and answer session. So, Cathy, will you please uh, outline how you're going to manage the briefing element of it, and then, and then we can take it from there? 
Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, we had presented um, a paper in advance of the meeting for the committee. And this was a follow up paper to um, after our meeting um, in December. And what I would propose to do is that I will talk through the issues relating to medical supplies. And then my colleague, Patricia Quinduffy, will take you through the areas of the paper relating to cross border services and people and afterwards leave some a good, good time for questions, uh, Chair. If you're happy with that, I can proceed. Yes, go ahead, Cathy. Thank you, Rob. Okay, great. Just by way of some background then, just um, on uh, the 30th of December 2020, the UK and the EU signed the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and that was to govern the future UK-EU trading and security relationship. And this free trade agreement has... Uh, uh, been applied provisionally now since the start of the year, the 1st of January, um, but it still needs to be formally ratified by the EU Parliament. The Northern Ireland Protocol came into effect in Northern Ireland on the 1st of January 2021, um, so just the start of this year. And under the Northern Ireland Protocol, the key issue for us in terms of medicines and medical devices is that Northern Ireland continues to follow EU laws and regulations in relation to goods, which include medicines and medical devices, um, whereas GB is no longer obliged to do so. Um, the um, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, um, which is the overall EU exit agreement that applies to the whole of the UK, covers quite a broad range of areas, and most of the, those areas actually um, relate to the information Patricia will update to you on later. So things like reciprocal health care, um, health care security, and uh, recognition of professional qualifications, etc. So she will follow that. Um, the Northern Ireland Protocol um, uh, I, I'm going to go through now and talk just a little bit about the medicines and then medical devices and what we're doing in terms of mitigations around that in order to ensure that we minimise any disruption at all to our patients and citizens in Northern Ireland. And um, But just to say what we've been dealing with since the beginning of January, Chair, the uh, committee may be interested to know what impact in general um, EU transition has had on our medicine supplies chain in Northern Ireland. And since, from the start of the year, my officials at the department have been dealing with quite a range of issues that have ar that have arisen relating to medicines and medical devices and that has had a in relation to supplies going into our hospitals, but also to our community pharmacies and some of our direct-to-patient models. I have to say that the majority of those issues were related to trader readiness, which in a way was anticipated given the large-scale changes that um, the supply chain were expected to introduce. And, and also I, have to, I can assure the committee that the majority of those issues are resolved now and we are working through them on a case-by-case -case basis and there's a few issues that remain to be sorted out. Uh, but we're just working through those as they come. Um, we did have a surveillance system in place to pick up those issues, and we still do. So we are still picking up issues on a daily and day-to-day uh, -day basis, and my team are still dealing with those. And we have very good connections across um, the UK uh, with HMRC and with DHSC and MHRA to work through solutions. And I hope we are uh, dealing with those. Well, I can assure the committee we're dealing with them very quickly as they arise. Um, the... In terms of the Northern Ireland Protocol, the pharmaceutical industry are currently benefiting from a grace period for medicines, and that was introduced um, at the start of January this year to give them a, tw a further 12 months to prepare for the large changes that are, um, are will come as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol. And that's because the protocol really has implications long-term implications for both supply and regulation of medicines. And historically, our model of supply of all medical products into Northern Ireland has relied on the free movement of supplies from Great Britain into Northern Ireland and around 98% of our medicines actually come through from uh, GB into Northern Ireland. However, under the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, medicines that are moving from GB into Northern Ireland will be handled as if they are goods entering the EU from a, U from a third country. And this means that medicines moving into Northern Ireland from GB will be subject to additional batch testing and other verification. And in addition, from the 1st of January next year, when the grace period ends, all the medicines that we use in Northern Ireland will have to comply with the EU Directive for Falsified Medicines direction, Directive. And that affects the packaging of our medicines and that again will not apply in GB from that date. 
Now, the pharmaceutical industry has begun to make changes, obviously, in advance of um, January next year. And we're working very closely with them. And there was also a lot of work going on at national level that we're involved with um, to work in partnership with industry and to help their preparations. I can answer some more questions about that later on. And there's another area in relation to medicines is licensing. And um, since the 1st of January, uh, if a medicine is licensed by both the UK regulator, which for us is the MHRA, and also the EU regulator, the EMA, in Northern, Ar Northern Ireland actually complies with the European license. Uh, that's just under the terms of the EU key. We are different now to the rest of the UK in that regard. Now, if there are differences that arise in the conditions that are um, detailed in each license, the European license or the or the um, MHRA license, then those that can present difficulties for us. And those sorts of areas of divergence are something that we're going to have to work through uh, again on a case by case basis. There is another issue that has arisen in relation to licensing that is being considered at the moment and being given a lot of attention and uh, by you, um, DHSC and working with the uh, EU Commission on this, and that is a difference of opinion between um, the locations of certain functions that are needed for the licensing of medicines. And MHRA have one interpretation and the uh, EU have another. And that, But that, those discussions, are they, that is potentially quite serious for for us in relation to slowing down um, access to new medicines and also the introduction of variations in, in medicines licensing, which happen quite routinely. So that is being given very top priority at the moment and is part of the talks that are going on um, with um, between UKGov and Europe, I understand. The, in medicines and the medical supply chain, we're also benefiting from two other grace periods. The one for parcels has helped us with some of our direct-to-patient models in particular. So home care and some of our stoma um, supplies um, have relied heavily on that and have benefited from the grace period for parcels. And also the export health certificate. Um, that grace period has helped us in relation to the movement of certain uh, medical feeds, and that would include infant milk and other nutritional supplements. Um, so we uh, welcome the fact that the grace periods for those were extended until the 1st of October. So the grace periods are welcome. We have the medicines grace period until the until the 1st of January next year and the two grace periods for parcels and DHC until October. And whilst they are welcome, uh, they provide some positive short term mitigations for us and give us more time to prepare for the big changes from next year. Um, the Department of Health um, and myself and my colleagues are working very closely with industry, MHRA and DHSC on longer term plans uh, because this is about long-term change and it affects all medicines and medical devices and to ensure we have processes in place that will support industry to be ready by the 1st of January next year there is a, pro, uh, a large program of work going on called the Northern Ireland um, Protocol Program overseen by the Northern Ireland Program Protocol Board which, which um, I'm a member of and that's looking at a multi-layered approach so we're looking at a wide range of issues um, that we uh, and support that needs to be put in place. Um, that said the significance of the work involved here chair really is massive there's a huge amount of work across a wide range of areas of work i mean all almost every aspect of our supply chain needs to be looked at so there is a recognition that the time scales are very very tight and a formal request was made by um um, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lan Lancaster um, in February that we actually could have an extension to that, um, our grace period until January 2023. That has not been granted at the moment, but it is something that I think industry would still say they would still need more time and, um, and we would, we, I, I imagine we will return to that request in the future. Um, there are also changes in medical devices. And here, the main change is that GB manufacturers of, of medical devices who plan to put place medical devices on the Northern Ireland market must now appoint an EU or a Northern Ireland based authorized representative. And that's in line with the EU key. Um, 
non-UK manufacturers are now required to appoint either a UK responsible person or a Northern Ireland authorised representative who, along with the Northern Ireland manufacturers, must, re must register devices with the MHRA before they're placed on the Northern Ireland market. So those changes are taking some time to bed in and some, uh, and certainly the, the medicines device industry are adapting to those at the moment. Um, we are benefiting from until the period of 30th of January, 2023, the UK are recognizing all EU certified CE mark devices in GB and that will help to support continuity of supply. Um, from GB to Northern Ireland. Um, this uh, May, we are going to see the introduction of the EU medical device regulations. They're going to come in force. And again, this is something that is different for Northern Ireland because they are an EU directive. So Northern Ireland will be complying with those regulations and um, GB will not. Um, the industry has known that this has been coming for quite a while. They've been planned and the GAF for guidance on this was first published in 2017. So industry should be preparing for that. There's a lot of support and advice has been published by MHRA and it's on the UK Gov website for industry but there is a recognition here that uh, this um, the medical devices industry still need more support and will need more ongoing advice um, and chair I'm going to hand over now to Patricia to pick up on the issues relating to access to healthcare and workforce thank you chair thank you Cathy for that um, uh, as Cathy has said, the um, trade and cooperation agreement was uh, agreed um, at the end of last year. And within that, um, it has given us some comfort around the reciprocal healthcare piece in terms that the social security protocol outlines all of the uh, reciprocal healthcare provisions um, that will apply within the between the EU and the UK. In essence, it replicates um, the regulations 883 on the coordination of Social Security um, for reciprocal health care, uh, almost in full. Um, so we will still have access to needs arising care, which would be similar to an EHIC. We will have access to planned treatment, which will be similar to an S2 in Northern Ireland that um, is generally used for um, major uh, treatments such as bone marrow transplant um, to uh, the south. We also will have access for frontier workers um, to continue to have access to treatment in the jurisdiction which in, within which they work. Um, there will also be provisions for pensioners um, and posted workers when they move to another country as well. So, in in essence, the there is a continuation of of the provisions for reciprocal healthcare for for most people. Um, there are some differences in terms that this does not apply to the EFTA countries, um, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, nor Switzerland. So currently, there is no reciprocal healthcare arrangements with those countries, and um, there has been a enactment of an older Norwegian UK um, reciprocal health care agreement um, which allows for needs arising care for British citizens and um, so there are a lot of difficulties around that in that it doesn't um, support anyone um, uh, residents of the UK and um, we're expecting that uh, hopefully there will be some movement on those agreements and um, within the next few months um, the agreement with Ireland was also signed at the end of last year, this MOU between the UK and Ireland to continue um, reciprocal arrangements. The trade and cooperation agreement overarches it um, and the UK and Ireland are going through both pieces to ensure that for the uh, post-transition um, arrangements that there are um, enough uh, provisions and which provisions apply. Within the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, there is a, a significant um, element of documentation, which between the UK and Ireland to date wasn't necessary. So, for example, a pensioner would require an S1, uh, a frontier worker may also require an S1. So those kind of documentations wouldn't have been um, commonly used within the UK and Ireland, but were 
because of the trade and cooperation agreement is a is an EU wide um agreement and it applies equally to all member states. There will be some new documentation. So that is being worked through at the moment um, so that everyone north and south and uh, in GB understand what they need to collect from um, citizens. Within the uh, reciprocal healthcare element, the withdrawal agreement uh, come into play at the end of the year. Um, for all citizens that had used their right of free movement. Um, it applies in full the regulation 883 on the coordination of social security to those people. It also applies to their family members and survivors. So there is an element of um, legacy and his historical um, application of the withdrawal agreement. Whilst the provisions are fairly similar within the trade and cooperation agreement and the withdrawal agreement. Um, there will be some element of people um, having, a, you know, there may be slightly more provision within the withdrawal agreement if they fall under that uh, um, provision rather than the trade and cooperation agreement. So there are some technical things um, in the guidance which we um, need to work through and provide guidance for people on the ground. Um, in terms of the, the legislation, the SR to implement the uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement um, is, is just being finalised at the moment. Um, the there was a number of issues that we had to sort of work through around um, how it would operate um, on the ground with um, the uh, the trusts and with BSO for registering people with GPs. So we've worked through that and we feel that um, the, the legislation um, sits well and, and understands and, and applies the provisions, but the, the committee will get that um, very shortly. Um, the next point um, within the sort of trade and cooperation agreement um, is the element of um, mutual recognition um, agreements for professional registration and professional qualifications. Um, what the trade and cooperation agreement did not do was um, come to an agreement on continuation of the mutual recognition of professional qualifications directive. So the UK and, and Europe did not come to an agreement on that. What they did come to an agreement on was a framework within which regulators can negotiate um, on a pan-European basis to um, come to an agreement on the recognition of qualifications. Um, in the this sphere, um, professions which are regulated um, uh, in legislation to practice or to use the official titles in, a, in another jurisdiction, the person needs to be registered um, within that jurisdiction. Um, what the MRPQ directive did was it allowed people to um, have their professions in certain circumstances automatically recognised, which meant that they didn't have to demonstrate um, that their qualification was up to standard. It also gave a, an element of um, that there was a, a, a temporary and occasional um, application, which meant that if you were only going to be occasionally within the jurisdiction, that there was a slightly simpler way to register, which was not a full registration. Um, because the TCA has not come to an agreement on this within the European jurisdictions, um, this no longer applies to Northern Ireland or UK trained professionals. So it means that all of those professionals will have to follow um, through the, the general um, dual registration route rather than having their qualification automatically recognised with a slightly shorter um, registration system. Um, the UK, on the other hand, has provided a two-year um, bridging grace period where they will still continue to um, accept the automatic professions. Um, not all healthcare professions are under the automatic recognition system. Um, social workers, for one, are not automatically recognised for their training, um, but doctors and nurses uh, 
pharmacists, etc., are. So within the UK, um, European trained um, automatic recognition will still continue. Also, if there has been a, a application for a temporary and occasional or there was a contract prior to the end of transition, that temporary and occasional um, registration into the UK will still apply um, for the year that it applies. Um, the other issues then that we have been looking at um, in terms of people, um, the settlement scheme um, is still open until the 30th of uh, June um, and it is required under the withdrawal agreement that if anyone wishes to um, apply their uh, their qualification for the withdrawal agreement that they should have their um, status ratified under the settlement scheme either with pre-settled status or settled status. Um, there is an opening where the Home Office have advised that they will um, accept late applications in exceptional circumstances, but they haven't expanded on what those exceptional circumstances may be. Um, so we're, we're again sort of encouraging people and using this forum to encourage those who haven't applied to apply. Um, and obviously the Home Office and DEO are um, promoting the settlement scheme within Northern Ireland uh, to all citizens. Um, the cross-border health care directive um, uh, finished at the end of uh, December last year and no longer applies to the UK. It also was not part of the trade and cooperation agreement and the UK and EU um, agreed that they felt that it, it wasn't to continue. Obviously Ireland, um, as you probably know, have implemented a scheme to come into Northern Ireland only um, to continue a similar provision on an administrative basis for 12 months and a paper on options is just being fin finalised, go to Minister on the options for Northern Ireland. Um, in terms of frameworks, um, the frameworks uh, for healthcare, the blood um, and the organs and tissue and the public health and uh, serious threats to cross-border health frameworks were agreed um, fully by the uh, Joint Ministerial Council on EU Exit Matters. Um, so they're some of the very few that have received clearance. Um, the next phase is um, parliamentary scrutiny. Um, and I've been liaising with your um, committee clerk on this matter, and we will be bringing those to the committee um, within the next few months uh, for scrutiny. Um, with the uh, election in Scotland and Wales, there is um, a little bit of delay in terms of the scrutiny across the UK as each jurisdiction will need to complete that themselves. Um, and on that, uh, obviously there'll be time for questions, which I'm sure you have plenty on this area. And uh, I'll hand back to, to Cathy. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Yes, Cathy? No, thank you, Chair. Just happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Cathy, first of all, I suppose, in relation to the uh, the medicines there that you touched upon and the medical devices, and I think there's some, I have to say, quite worrying language uh, now in terms of, of concern around this issue. And just to kind of orientate uh, the committee to the scale of this, what sort of level of, of uh, medicines are impacted here in terms of financial or potentially being impacted at the present time or will be impacted when the grace period ends? Um, Chair, this affects all medicines that are used in Northern Ireland at the moment. So I think we have about 9,000 lines that we would, act, we would regularly use and all medical devices. So this covers everything that would be covered by, governed by, you know, our um, EU, EU the EU key and in relation to the regulation of medicines and medical supply medical devices and in terms in terms of monetary value um, I understand but just to give us an idea what sort of monetary value are we talking about in terms of medicines mm -hmm. on an annual basis? 600 million 
Okay, on medical devices. Mm -hmm. I don't have I don't actually have that figure column on, on medical devices. We don't monitor it in the same way, but I can I can I can get an estimate from our trusts and what they use and from BSO for you. Okay, okay, thanks, Kathy. And you had said there that there's a difference of opinion, which which is worrying in itself, but you then went on to say it's quite serious. That's quite serious. So in terms of risk here, what are we talking about? In terms of your risk risk register, where have you this placed this this issue at present? The um in terms of the, I suppose that the, the, the thing to say is without mitigation, these are very high risk. Okay, so with the, in, in, if, if without, without us taking action and without uh, sort of a very proactive approach being taken, and if we did nothing at all until the end of the, the, this year, then a lot, there would be a high level of risk and it would be considered a very high risk area, uh, Chair. However, there's an enormous amount of work going on to avoid that. Um, and ahead of the overall transition of the UK from the EU, there was a massive amount of work done with the medical supply chains. That's really now standing us in good stead in terms of our understanding of the supply chains. And also we've got very good relationships built up. That said, there's a lot of work to be done now on the detail. Um, this uh, the movement of goods of our medicines from GB to Northern Ireland is problematic because there's additional checks such as batch testing that it means the pharmaceutical industry are are looking for ways to avoid that route uh, where they where they can. So there's a there's a reorientating of the medic medicine supply chain going on at the moment. Each each part of the pharmaceutical industry is considering what it means for them. We have a lot of engagement with them. I personally meet with a wide range of um, uh, partners from within and different parts of industry, wholesaling, haulage, etc. And also, there's a there's intense intense engagement goes on at a national level as well. Where what I'm hearing is they're all thinking their way into this now. More than that, they're starting to make plans and. Uh, there are changes coming, Chair. And so in terms of our role at the department, what we're, our priority is that we maintain access of medicines and we also maintain equity of access to medicines. So those two things, so that means our supplies are maintained and also that there's we maintain an equity with other UK citizens in relation to access to new medicines and new therapies. Okay, and and I, I suppose it is you know many of us and you and I have been discussing this issue about concern around medicines for several years now, and we're in a position where we're we're operating we're 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 moving fairly smartly through the first grace period, and there's a request in then to extend that grace period to January twenty three. If January twenty three isn't forthcoming and it it hasn't been to date, I think from what you've told us, what are the potential uh, outcomes of what's what's the potential outcome of that? What's the worst case scenario in in January twenty three if the, uh, or January twenty two if there's no extension to the grace period? What could we see happening here? Well, I think that, I mean we're all, I'm already hearing that some parts of the pharmaceutical industry are have made decisions and will be ready. So you know I'm in some of the meetings I've had I'm getting quite high levels of assurance in terms of, yes, we're making these changes. Things are, it will have an impact uh, in terms of um, our supplies in Northern Ireland, which we'll come back to in a minute. The, where there are, I, I think what we will, what, what I'm working with on at the moment, Chair, is I'm working with colleagues in DHSC and MHRA on a range of mitigations that if we need them, we will step in to avoid disruption to the supply chain for our patients. I think that, that I think that's really an, the most important message from today is that a lot of the changes that are going to be happening here are within the supply chain and we are working very hard and have so far managed to keep away the impact from the front line. So from our frontline clinicians and from our uh, patients and that's what we will be intending to do. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that's that 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 is, that is crucial, and that is in certainly the first the first imperative. I mean, no one wants to see a situation where people 
are being impacted health wise in terms of in terms of a uh, reduction in supply is there is there a potential increase in costs facing us here and you've, you've talked about 600 million so obviously we're, we're facing already a very difficult budgetary situation generally and in health in particular are we looking at potential significant cost increases as a result of the, the things you're setting out there Kathy? They, certainly the engagement with industry would indicate that they have increased costs now in the supply chain relating to Northern Ireland. Um, essentially, Northern Ireland is now um, a, a very small market globally for pharmaceuticals and for medical devices. And the industry are, I have to say, there's a very high level of commitment that I've had from all parties that I've been involved with within the pharmaceutical industry in terms of uh, working, working towards a new normal if you like, for Northern Ireland. But there's a recognition in doing that that our costs are likely to increase. Um, we're doing some work um, within the team in terms of that, and obviously we're having to put in place um, enhanced surveillance arrangements. There's quite a lot of work needed done in terms of within Northern Ireland in terms of our supply chain. Um, where, because in the past we have relied on being just part of the UK supply chain. So we're now going to have to have enhanced surveillance on costs and access to medicines and on um, issues such as discontinuations. And what's your estimate of how, how much costs are likely to increase by? We don't have an we don't have an indication yet um, of what that will be. It's very hard to predict at the moment because companies are just beginning to make decisions, business decisions, and they're actually the pharmaceutical industry as well are waiting for some critical pieces of guidance to come from, um, uh, you know, from from, from um, government. Um, and some of those pieces of guidance are related to the ongoing discussions that are happening in e, uh, at EU level. Now, that I understand is, you know, within weeks, industry will be receiving further guidance. And at that point, they'll, be, they'll start to cement their plans. Then we will know our engagement with industry will shift into what the implications of that will be, uh, Chair. So obviously, we will be coming back to the committee with more information as as you know, as, as, as um, business decisions are made by industry in terms of how they're going to adapt. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Cathy. My second question is probably more for Patricia. Um, it's in relation to dual registration of qualifications and staffing issues generally. And clearly, we're all acutely aware of the issues that we have with, uh, with staff pressures, um, with waiting lists, and the impact that workforce and workforce vacancies are having on all of that. So obviously anything that creates a chill factor or, or a barrier to people working here is of, of major concern. So in relation to the dual professional registration, Patricia, um, what services are likely to be impacted as a result of that requirement now changing? Um, the requirement to be dual registered hasn't actually changed. It's the method of registration has changed. So there was always a requirement to be registered. Um, I think that uh, needs to be made quite clear. Uh, anyone who is already registered um, continues to be registered and recognised under the withdrawal agreement. So if any professionals have already registered, that registration continues. Um, so, so therefore that um, isn't impacted. So for those who are new registrants, um, who are working in the in the Republic as part of their role, um, there will be a need to be registered. Um, we have estimated that the services which go into the South um, are the NYSTAR in particular to the Children's Paediatric in Dublin when there's a, a hospital transport of a, of a child. Um, the other impacted services would be uh, paramedics, um, where there is an, a, a mutual um, mutual uh, uh, an MOU memorandum of understanding couldn't remember what yeah. that meant there um, between the two um, ambulance services around the border regions to support one another and the other time that people may go into the the republic is for social workers who are looking at at um, at risk children that are being placed with family members or in, in care in either or jurisdiction. Now these are um, cross-border services in terms of, of going both ways. Um, 
would there have been discussions on, on way uh, on all of those professions and all of those services uh, and we are not expecting that there would be impact on those services but the the registration of the nurses and doctors in particular around the um the nystar and um, once they are registered there will be no further impact to the the services um in that um, most of the other services come north uh, in terms of its its patients from the south coming to the north to have treatment and if professionals in the north are giving advice um, say for example the Northwest Cancer Centre where they're giving advice over the phone to patients who are phoning up all of those things will be continue to be covered by the registration in Northern Ireland alone um, so there's a slight mixed bag of, of registrations um, and because the UK have a two year um, grace period for European qualifications and it is for specifically the two year period is specifically for healthcare professions anyone coming into the UK will be able to um, still have their professions automatically recognised so there is less barriers for people coming um, into Northern Ireland there, than there are UK trained professionals going out into EU jurisdictions and in particular into the Republic um, I don't know whether that answers your question or not there is obviously negotiations and uh, work that is ongoing between the regulators um, to look at the um, the framework which is in the TCA. That is obviously going to be a slightly longer term process because it is a pan-European agreement on the recognition of training. Um, so that will have to be agreed by all of the member states. So that isn't going to happen um, within the short term. We then have agreements within the CTA, uh, in the overarching MOU on the CTA, it has been agreed that the regulators would work together um, on this uh, issue. Now, again, because this was part of the UK-EU negotiations, there wasn't any work really done before the end of last year on this subject because it was part of that overarching negotiations. So this is where we are now, is that regulators are talking to one another and starting that process for um, coming to agreements within the CTA, within the EU. Um, but as I say, those things won't happen um, in the short term. Okay, and in terms of in terms of recruitment from from other European countries other than other than the south, from uh, other European countries and outside, have you noticed any further difficulties or any tailing off in that recruitment process as a result of Brexit? Um, it's probably slightly more in terms of COVID and movement of people rather than. Well, we don't have. I don't have any figures to hand on that. Um, what will probably impact more around Europeans is the. Um, the immigration requirements rather than the recognition of qualifications because there is a continuation of recognition of qualifications um, in coming to the UK. So the new immigration um, requirements mean that someone coming to work needs to have a work visa. So there is an expense to um, Europeans coming into the UK. Um, the, the healthcare visa reduces the price um, and cost to incoming um, potential workforce. Um, so there is a less of a, an impact on healthcare workers than there is to other professions. The waiver on the immigration health surcharge currently for healthcare professionals also um, reduces the cost. Um, so if those change, um, there will probably be a, a slightly more impact in terms of Europeans. However, with the, these um, provisions, what it does provide, however, is access to rest of world professionals. Um, and it actually makes rest of world professionals, it reduces the cost that they would have had. Um, there's no limit on the amount of people that can be recruited. Um, so it kind of does open out and um, rest of world compared to Europe. Um, but what I think the government uh, is intending to do is to do a review 
of the impact of the points-based system to see has it impacted on recruitment into the UK and how that has worked. Um, but at this point in time, it's very, very difficult to say. Okay, and just very briefly, Patricia, if you can, um, what engagement have you had with your counterparts in the south in relation to the cross-border uh, flexibilities and, and workforce issues there? We have had a number of meetings with them around the the, the sort of the provisions and um, what we can do and trying to find solutions and coming to a common um, agreement because it is in everyone's interest that cross-border services continue that they are developed and that other services can be put in place and um, at the moment um within europe uh, there are obviously restrictions on what ireland can do as they have to comply with the european um a key which we don't and um, but we are working with them and we would have regular conversations with them around this issue okay thank you and then my final one um is on the reciprocal healthcare and the cross-border directive. Now, I am starting to see large numbers of people who are now being impacted by this. I'm sure other reps here on yeah. the other MLAs will be similarly. Um, I understand that the legacy the legacy cases are still being being dealt with, and there are some short term reciprocal between between here and the twenty six counties. However, other parts of Europe were a significant outlet, and given the fact yes. of the weakness situation that we have currently, is this not a, a disaster, and should this not be a priority to get something to replace that cross border directive urgently in place? The options are going to Minister and once they he and uh, has decided and uh, looked at the options and given advice, we will then be, obviously be able to come back with a further detail on that. So nothing you can tell the committee today in relation to what, what is being done here to, to, to address the situation where people had been able to, as a result of when we were when we were uh, still fully part of the of the European Union before Brexit, people were able to avail of treatments. What can you tell those people to offer some hope or light? Um, there are waiting list initiatives which are underway to try and address the waiting lists and waiting times, um, and particularly because of COVID. So those waiting list initiatives are being taken forward as a priority within the department to address waiting times. Um, so that is really the focus of the um, of how the waiting lists and waiting times will be addressed. The cross-border healthcare directive was an additional um, provision which was available whilst part of the European Union. Um, options are being given to the minister as to whether or not those will be able to be continued. And we will, I, I do have to wait on his um, decision on that, um, uh, the options that are being laid for him. When would you when would you expect a decision from the Very very shortly. I was actually got this morning. I was waiting on a, a sort of legislative and some legal advice which I received this morning. So that will be going um, uh, this week to minister. Okay, thank you. And before I go to members, Kathy, I just want to go back to you, Kathy, on the issue about the risk register. I had asked you. I'm not sure if I picked up exactly on your response in terms of medicines. So I take it. I take it that you will have a risk register. What is the status? What 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 level of risk have you uh, attributed to that medicine supply in your risk register? Um, Chair, within the within the overall risk register in relation to um, these matters, uh, medicines would be considered high risk and red at the moment. Okay. Okay, thank you. So I'll go across then to members. And at this point in time, I have indications from Jonathan Buckley, Paula Bradshaw, Orlea Flynn, Alan Chambers and Pam Cameron in that order. So I'll go to you first there, Jonathan. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, uh, Kathy and Patricia. I appreciate your presentation. I suppose probably down at the very beginning, you will know that I, I do have deep concern about the impending implications and implementation of the protocol. Uh, I think this particular issue in relation to medicine supplies and indeed devices uh, has not been given the political scrutiny that it deserves at present because it has been uh, somewhat pushed down the line with the 12-month derog derogation, which is welcome in the first instance, but as has, been meant, as has already been mentioned, the time is ticking on that clock. So I suppose probably, firstly, I would like to, Cathy, you had mentioned 
about the engagement that's going on. So I would really like you to give us a broad outline of what is the minister and the department doing at a UK level to promote a mutual recognition agreement between the UK and the EU for medicines? And is there any realistic prospect of this processing and progressing at pace before the end of the year? Obviously, this is going to be crucial as to whether or not there's a cliff edge uh, after that derogation period ends. So that would be my first question to Cathy. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Jonathan. And the engagement that is going on in relation to matters such as mutual recognition and which come goes right to the heart of, um, I suppose, some of the regulatory challenges that the industry are dealing with. Um, those issues are handled at a national level, and they are handled by uh, through the Specialist Committee on Ireland and Northern Ireland. And uh, those meetings are ongoing. And medicines, you know, we our, our minister um, asked specifically in February for medicines to be uh, the medicines and medical devices issues to be um, escalated up in terms of attention being given. Uh, by the EU, by the EU on this matter, and that was successful. So now medicines are being considered at those high level meetings. That's where key decisions are made in relation to uh, the interpretation of the Northern Ireland Protocol. In terms of the engagement of our Department of Health, we are engaged. Um, in a wide range of different groups. The high, there is a, a high level program board that I'm a member of uh, that's looking at Northern Ireland program, protocol program board. And that is looking, and that reports to Steve Oldfield, who's the chief operating officer for DHSC. Uh, and he reports then into cabinet office. So there's a very high, high level of attention being given to this. We are fully connected into that. We have regular meetings each week. We're very, very engaged in this agenda. But those critical decisions, uh, we are able to feed into those through our engagement through the program board, also through our engagement through TEO and their contacts. Um, TEO are also fully in, uh, briefed and up to date on all of these issues uh, and can also support in terms of their engagement. But the critical decisions are made at EU level with uh, and UK government. Government. Okay, so g g given your engagement there, and I understand that's quite extensive and that it, that is important, what is your professional assessment of the realistic prospect of a progressing before the end of the year when the derogation period ends? I think we have a very ambitious work program that we're working on. And uh, I think that we uh, work has started. It's not, there's a, not a lot of work is ongoing. I think the timeline is extremely challenging. I, I do. I think it is. I think 12 months was challenging. And now that we are well into the year, um, it's, it, it, it is challenging. That's what I'm hearing from industry. It's mm -hmm. not a uniform picture, however. Some parts of industry, um, obviously, pharmaceutical industry is a very, very broad church. You have uh, multi-billion pound global companies who are used to very, dealing with highly complex supply chains all around the world. And they've already made decisions in terms of what they're going to do. Uh, but there's also much smaller players um, who uh, within that that, I, that we recognize uh, at the department. And also it's recognized by all people working in this in the UK that they have a lot of issues to deal with in the time frame given. given. Given the huge difficulties that the protocol is going to present in relation to those GB companies accessing NI, could you give us a headline figure uh, percentage-wise as to uh, the percentage of medical goods and devices that come from GB mainland into Northern Ireland as a total? Uh, you might not have that figure on your present, but it would be interesting to know. And given the multitude of legal cases that have now been taken in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Are you aware of any legal action that will be forthcoming from the Minister or the Department in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol and the disadvantage that it places Northern Ireland citizens at at present? Um, your first question in relation to the amount, uh, the percentage of uh, medical goods that move from GB to Northern Ireland is uh, it's very, very high. I mean, we estimated at around 98% at present. That's because we, we have always been just part of the UK supply chain. There's not been a separate Northern Ireland supply chain until uh, until now. Uh, and so, so there's, our goods have just 
So it's almost 100% um, come in from GB to Northern Ireland currently. Um, there's no, uh, I can advise that I'm not aware of any legal action being taken by the department at the moment. Yeah. You know, that, that figure should scare anybody that, you know, 98% of medicine supplies and devices that are coming in from GB that are affected by the madness of the Northern Ireland Protocol. So it is a serious issue. It's, it's one that I'm glad to see the department is engaging proactively on to try and find uh, solutions and including uh, an extension period to sort these issues out. Um, I, w- I would ask Cathy to maybe come back to, to me or the committee personally in relation to is there any legal options being explored? Uh, and another question for you would be, have there been any cases of Category 1 goods being delayed at ports when arriving in Northern Ireland? And when will the six-month uh, ferry operator contracts end? The, uh, uh, we... Anticipated before the uh, at the start of the year, we anticipated that we would have some disruption in relation to delays at ports, but actually that never materialised. We had um, the issues that we um, have been dealing with. Um, and have to say dealing with successfully and sorting out for patients so that most patients have been unaware of any impact at all and the health service as well. Most of the issues have been um, around trader readiness and business decisions that um, companies have had to make um, in terms of just changes that have that have arisen um, because of EU exit and no, the Northern Ireland Protocol. But there's in terms of those specific delays, I know, I'm not aware of any specific delays coming in from GB to, to Northern Ireland um, of any significance, you know, that, that had an impact. Okay, and just uh, I have two final ones. So what which seasonal goods, yes, I know, Chair, but uh, that's a very, very detailed presentation and one that requ- requires us to give a thorough examination. Uh, which seasonal vaccines could be most affected um and how could the supply issues be mitigated if uh, post 31st of December? And also, what is the state of play on the EU-related SRs and what is still to be agreed and legislated for at this stage? Will it be necessary to bring forward further legislation in advance of the 12-month derogation period? Okay, so first of all, in terms of vaccines, so, um, we are working to continue with our na- our involved the involvement of Northern Ireland in national vaccination programs, and that work is well advanced, and uh, we're working on that. So, um, that uh, in terms of the EU related SRs, perhaps Patricia has that information. Patricia, could you help with that? Yes, there there may be during the year some technical amendments that have um, appeared um, due to sort of uh, scrutiny of, of the legislation that was laid pre um, the end of transition. I, I think we have possibly uh, two. There is one coming forward um, shortly around um, healthcare security, which I think is going to committee quite shortly, um, which is part of the... Um, applications around the frameworks for the healthcare security piece. Um, we also may have a few uh, technical amendments around um, MRPQ and the legislation that was laid, but nothing that's particularly significant. It's to uh, f- basically amend deficiencies in the legislation that was laid. Um, there may be some, um, as agreements come between the UK and Europe and or other jurisdictions, there may be amendments made to just apply those, um, whether it's a trade agreement or um, a reciprocal health care agreement, those may need to be applied um, through some legislation. But at this point in time, we aren't expecting uh, a particular volume of, of work to come through still. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Cathy. And thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Jonathan. I'm going then to Carol Nicolon. Go ahead, Carol, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Cathy, and thank you, Patricia. Um, can you tell me, if, or tell the committee, actually, when it, you, there, in your presentation paper, it said there's cross-border healthcare directive and that it's being, uh, or even that Britain and Ireland are reviewing the terms of the MOU to clarify the interaction with the TCA. Um, what, where's that sitting? And could you also um, answer, if you can, it seems to me that the minister has just taken his direction 
from um, the, the British government. So what uh, particular circumstances and implications are being fed through that process? And then the final question I have is, in relation, uh, Cathy, to the drugs bill, um, I mean, the minister made a statement in the Assembly this week about waiting times, and I think maybe that's what Patricia was alluding to, but I don't know, because the statement was vague and Patricia's comments on that were vague also. So perhaps we could find out about that, and then in relation to the the use of probably generic drugs, because given you said there's going to be a financial increase, um, what what is that increase, and are generic drugs being explored that will be cheaper, given the fact that you've also correctly described it as an industry, the pharmaceutical industry? So thank you, Chair, if we could get those questions answered. Um. Thank you, Carol. I'll take the, the first few questions. You were asking about the um, the MOU and the um, TCA and the interaction. Um, basically, there were two pre-exit, there were two different strands of um, health care that could be attained. Um, there was that which was under the uh, Social Security coordination um, regulations, which would have included your EHIC, which is your needs arising care when you went abroad, your S2, which was a planned care route to public hospitals. And the other was then where people moved around and uh, say, for example, pensioners. So pensioners that would retire to another EU state, wherever they worked, they were still responsible to pay for their health care. So under the TCA, most of those provisions uh, continue um, in sort of anticipation um, Ireland and the UK were negotiating a continuation of that kind of reciprocal health care under the auspices of the common travel area and um, so we ended up at the end of the year with two documents that are almost similar so what is happening is that the UK government and the Irish government are working through the the provisions in both the um, Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the Ireland-UK MOU um, to identify basically which one applies um, and which one gives the most provision to, to, to patients moving around. Um, we are involved in those discussions um, because with the border we do have um, the most daily and, and use of, of those kind of provisions. So we are involved and we, we are at the table with those. Um, but it is between the UK and Irish governments um, to come to those arrangements. The cross-border health care directive is a slightly different provision. Um, this provision was um, within Europe was based on the free access to services. Um, because the trade and cooperation agreement doesn't um, come to any agreement on the provision of services. Um, the directive no longer applies to the UK. Um, the Minister um, ha has asked us to look at how um, and what the options may be for that kind of provision um, going forward for Northern Ireland patients. Um, so what we're looking at is how or why that may be able to apply whether it is possible to apply, whether it would be legal within the UK framework, because the overarching frameworks within the European Union no longer apply to the UK. Um, so there's a, quite a lot of technical legal issues that we needed to bottom out first. Um, and that, as I said um, to Chair, I've got my final um, legal advice this morning. So we should be able to get that to Minister uh, today, tomorrow, um, for his then consideration. Um, the cross-border health care directive was a provision where a patient could opt out of the national system and uh, attend a, a private or public clinic or, or hospital in another European jurisdiction, pay up front for their health care and have the equivalent value of what that treatment would have cost in their home jurisdiction repaid. Um, so that it's a very different type of provision than the uh, reciprocal health care arrangements. Um, the other thing that you had talked about was the waiting list initiatives. Um, I don't have detail on um, what the waiting list program is going to be and um, we would need to come back to the committee about that because it's not part of the EU 
strand. It's part of the um, uh, sort of the COVID um, recovery phase. So, I mean, we can get um, officials to come back with some more detail around that. Um, but the, there is a waiting list program and a waiting list initiative program which is underway to try and address the waiting lists um, that are currently um, it, it, quite very long is probably the only way to describe them. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Carol. Um, go sorry, ahead. sorry, yeah. Colm, sorry, Colm, I haven't had any feedback on the drugs bill um, either. Okay. The, yeah, um, the, uh, the issue on the drugs bill, <clears throat> you raised the question about generic medicines and in Northern Ireland. I suppose if we look at medicines, the medicines we use, they fall into two broad categories. Branded medicines, which are still under patent, they tend to be newer medicines that um, are introduced into Northern Ireland at the same time as the rest of the UK at the moment. They would be covered by NICE, for example, where we would be waiting for new innovative medicines and they come out and they're covered by patent for a number of years. And now, uh, in t and the other category are generic medicines and that's when medicines come off patent and then there's just basically an open market across the world where many, many generics companies then uh, provide generic medicines at a much lower cost. In Northern Ireland, we would have in the region of around 80% of our prescribing is generic and very high, among the highest in Europe uh, and certainly on a par with the rest of the UK. Um, we would be very, very keen to continue the, that split and we would see in terms of, so that that is one of our, going to be one of our areas of focus will be really to continue to work with the generic manufacturers. They do have a particular challenge for the new way of working and that is because Northern Ireland is a smaller market, um, the generics companies work on a very, very tight profit margin. So they're all, they are, and there's a lot of them. There's a lot of them. So, um, so, so some specific work is going on in terms of working with generics on generics and other. We're also what we're doing is we're looking at other weak points in our supply chain, uh, and that where we might have very small. Um, manufacturers of drugs who have, although their drugs might still be covered by their patent, they might be branded, they might supply so little, small, such a small volume into Northern Ireland that we become then uh, an unattractive market. So there's quite a complex uh, amount of sort of issues to deal with here in terms of uh, Northern Ireland, but on generics, you're right, they're critical to the um, managing cost-effective prescribing in Northern Ireland, and that's something we have done successfully for many years. We do see, and we are hearing, that there's a risk of cost increases. Of course, as we get into new ways of working, we'll have to find a way of getting to a new normal where our, our prescribing is still cost-effective. We definitely don't want to go move backwards. Okay, thank you. Okay, going then to Paula Bradshaw. Go ahead, Paula. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for your presentation this morning. I suppose it lies bare again the, the folly of Brexit. Um, my, my sound isn't great this morning, so apologies if you've um, answered some of these questions already. But it's paragraph 39. It relates to the, nor the new planned Northern Ireland healthcare scheme from the Irish government, and it's being operated on an admin basis. Could you explain what you mean by admin? It's, you've said also that it's in place for 12 months. When did that start? When did it finish? And is there going to be any extension of this sort of admin basis period, um, given um, the impact on COVID and shutdown of services? That's my first question. Thank you. Paula, the cross-border healthcare uh, Ireland scheme is being run by the Irish government for Irish citizens to come into Northern Ireland. Um, so that's really what that scheme is. It's not anything that we in the department have done. Um, those patients will predominantly be going into the private uh, sector. Um, the scheme started on the 28th of December and will run for a year um, and is being run on an administrative basis. Um, my understanding is that they don't have the... Um, they're looking at the provisions um, as to whether it can continue post December, um, but it's really a matter for the Irish government as to how they manage that scheme. Okay, thank you. And, and the second one picks up on um, what Cathy was um, speaking to the chair about, and that's the registration of healthcare staff who are operating on both sides of the border. Um, what, one of the categories of, of staff who've got in contact with me are those who work in the air ambulance, and you'll know 
um, Kathy will be aware that there's been very, very few incidents um, when people, whenever the staff have actually had to go across the border to perform an operation um, as such. So they're, they're concerned that even though the Department of Health have agreed to, to cover the cost of it, that the, the actual administrative burden on them to find all their qualifications and submit for registration in the Irish Medical Council, for example, in the midst of a pandemic is an awful lot of work. And they're just wondering why the Memorandum of Understanding could not have on this occasion for these very, very infrequent um, cross-border operations um, uh, to actually not have just extended to, to cover that because it just seems like a lot of work at this point in time. Thank you. Um, Paula, I'll maybe um, take that one again. Um, yes, we do appreciate that, that there is an awful lot of work and that the administrative burden does lay, lay with the, the applicant themselves. Um, we are speaking to the Irish government and we are trying to work with the regulators to provide some support on this. But unfortunately, these are regulators within a different jurisdiction to us and they have to comply with their own legislation and their own requirements. Um, we can try to negotiate, um, but again, because this was part of the overarching UK-EU negotiations, we weren't able to do anything prior to the end of transition. So it, it's something that we are we are very keenly aware of. We are aware of what this means for North-South Healthcare Cooperation. Um, we are emphasising that um, position um, both in the UK and with the Republic um, and are working with regulators as much as we can um, to try and come to some arrangements. Um, as I've said before, there are frameworks um, within the European Union under the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, but that is going to be a slightly longer term process. Um, and the, the regulators under the MOU with between the UK and Ireland on the CTA can work together. Um, but again, it's not going to happen um, within a very short time period. So unfortunately, we are in a position where we need to have something in place. Um, and it really is that people need to be dual registered and we will try and support those applicants as much as we can um, but it is a matter for operational colleagues um, so as I say I mean we're trying to do as much as we can to mitigate this and to have these um, things in, in place to ensure that the, the continuation of the services. Um, well th thank you just to pick up on that chair finally then um, given the very very small frequency um, with which um, the air ambulances had to go into the south to, to support people. Is there any way that you're actually possibly going to halt that? Or would um, the department to say actually while this happens? It just it just seems that the people who are you're on the on the air ambulance at the minute, they've got massive burden within our hospitals at the minute and I just think that at this point in time it's probably for the amount of work they'll have to put in compared to the frequency, it probably is more more to actually halt that. Paula, we, uh, I'll probably come back with a bit more detail, but my understanding is that there is a, an emergency um, where there is a, a, a threat to life. So there is potentially a provision where that might be able to be used. Um, but I'll, I can come back to you with more detail on that. Um, the the temporary and occasional provision was probably the the more appropriate way, but there is still an application process around the temporary and occasional um, registration, um, you know, and it's to get it that it is because those those forays can be quite infrequent. It is to try to come to some arrangement that um, and that it works more appropriately. But I'll come back with a bit more detail around the emergency provision. Okay, I appreciate that. I appreciate all your work on this regard. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. And going then to. Um, Orlea Flynn, go ahead, Orlea, please. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Cathy and, and Patricia. I have to say your, your briefings are always really detailed and I find them very useful. Um, Patricia, I know that we're, a couple of the members have touched on this a few times, but just to come back to you quickly for a point of clarification. So see the healthcare common frameworks, you had mentioned that those are in place. And at the last briefing, there was talk of, so the first three um, common frameworks, but that the fourth framework was the one around cross-border healthcare. So is that fourth framework um, 
is that already in place or is that still under review? Because I know it was to be reviewed in, in the springtime. The the process for the frameworks that have been paused or were agreed for no further action is just underway at the moment. So the, it'll be looked at, um, it's being looked at currently. So there'll be another round of whether or not it's appropriate that that um, framework is, is required or not. Um, and it covered both reciprocal health care and the um, cross-border health care directive. And would that would that be would that be contained or included within your options paper that you're sent to the minister? No, and no. It, it the framework really is is how the internal market within the UK will work, and how jurisdictions within the UK will work together if there are divergences, and also that there's an agreement within the UK as to how the um the external negotiations um, for international agreements are taken forward. Um, as healthcare is a devolved matter, um, the devolved regions have a, have a say over how their, their healthcare works. Um, international agreements are a reserved matter. So the UK government is negotiating those with other countries. So the UK needs to agree how that negotiation works. The framework, that was what the framework was setting out to do. The reason why it was decided that it was um, no further action is that under the Healthcare EEA and Switzerland Arrangements Act, there is a, a memorandum of understanding between the jurisdictions of the UK as to how any regulations or agreements would be um, taken forward by the UK government. And it felt that that was a more legislative and more practical method to do it. But we will all, as separate jurisdictions, look at this again to make sure that we have the appropriate mechanisms in place. That's great, Patricia, and it would be really useful if you do take another look at that in, in your review, if, if you could yeah. maybe update the committee, that would be sure. that would be really useful. Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, and then maybe, Cathy, um, just a couple of questions to yourself. So I know, obviously, when, when you briefed us in December, um, you were speaking about that nervousness amongst the stakeholders and clearly that nervousness is still there and and, and within the Department of Health um, by all sounds of it. So I'm just wondering, do, do we know that um, when we're talking about the medical su supply chains, do we know how many of our local stakeholders have signed up to that trader support service or indeed how many haven't? And if that could be impacting on the, you know, the issues with the, the translation with the medical supplies, that's my first question to Cathy. Um, certainly at the start of the year, there was evidence that um, some of our, it wasn't so much our local traders, I have to say, because I think in Northern Ireland, people really were very tuned in. And uh, and I have to just say, I have to say they, they, in general, uh, in our, in, in, well, not in general, in across all of our stakeholders within the pharmaceutical industry and, and, and wholesaler industry, they were fully ready. Where the problems arose with trader readiness really was more on the wide range and multiple suppliers who supply into Northern Ireland, and also some some. So I think well, so issues certainly arose early on. Those have largely, I wouldn't say they've all gone away, but there's a higher, much much higher awareness now um, of trader support service. So I don't think that is. That is not a residual concern that we've got at the moment, uh, you know, in terms of moving forward. I think the companies are registered now and um, largely there's a much better understanding across the UK. OK, that's great. And then just finally, Jonathan had touched on this earlier with you, Cathy, just around. So that 98 percent figure of um, medicine supplies coming in from Britain um, into the north. So that 98% figure, has have any of them statistics changed on movements, you know, from the new sort of structures and arrangements and the transition has been put in place? So note the last briefing you were talking about, you know, different companies are taking different approaches as to how to maintain supplies, whether it be that they're going from, um, you know, flying from the EU into the north or from south to north, um, mm -hmm. or indeed then Britain into the north. So that 98% figure, can you see that fluctuate and have you monitored any change? And then just finally, um, the, the, the range of issues that you had referenced earlier um, regarding the supply chain to our hospitals and pharmacies. Could you elaborate just a wee bit more on what those sort of specific issues are? You know, are we already starting to see delays or shortages? Um, and hopefully that, that surveillance system can be strengthened as you referenced earlier to try and help um, to try and help mitigate against that. Thank you. Um, uh, on your first question, in terms of evidence of change of the ninety-eight percent, not we haven't. Uh, the 
we haven't got any evidence yet that um, around that. I suppose that figure really represents what our historical supply chain, you know, we just basically are part of the UK. Um, what we do, I do know now is that companies are starting to make some decisions about coming up through the Republic of Ireland and also direct to Northern Ireland uh, uh, models. And over the coming months, we'll get more information about that and we will uh, we'll have to consider new ways of monitoring. There's no ways of monitoring these things at the moment. Uh, we've never had to. So I think really I would like the committee to recognise that you know, this is going to be long-term change, it's going to take long term, quite a lot of time and probably investment as well for us to get new ways of, you know, for surveillance of the market and for monitoring this and also monitoring cost impacts. We're starting that work this year, um, but I can see it that a lot more will need to be done. Um, the issues relating to hospitals and everything, yes, we've uh, we across a range of issues. Um, I, I suppose the common pattern really was um, where companies where there was a misunderstanding around who would make the um, declarations in terms of um, import declarations and uh, responsibilities around companies. Um, I can't really give you any examples because there's sort of commercial and, and confidence, but, you know, we, we dealt with a wide range of issues. We also dealt with quite a range of issues um, involving where there would be third parties involved in the supply chain. The medical supply chain just is so complex. We know <laughs> we did know that anyway, but now we really know. But quite often where you would have, for example, a third party logistics company, like, you know, a parcels provider. Um, you know, they actually have quite an important role in getting medicines direct to patients', patients homes, particularly for some ho home care medicines and um, for products such as stoma and incontinence products that where patients just make a decision for, for, for pr privacy that they would rather have those products. So there was quite a, that cat, that the third party logistics issue, certainly that was quite quite that's quite was quite an active category of issues that we had but other than that it was mainly down to individual readiness um, on business and the delays or shortages as opposed, was the important part of the question for our hospitals the medicine. delays um where I, I think where what we did was we intervened in most cases um we intervened to avoid any impact on patients and uh, in some cases where we heard, sometimes we had patients start contact us directly, we were able to intervene and, and turn things around very, very quickly. Um, so I wouldn't say there was no impact, but I think there was a very, very minimal impact on, on patient care um, across most issues. Thanks very much, Kathy. Okay, thank you, Arlea. And going now to Alan Chambers. Go ahead, Alan, please. Hello, can you yeah, hear me? Yeah, we're, here. we're here and you're okay. Thank you, Chair. Sorry. Uh, Kathy, just uh, at the outset, to declare thank and commend your department for the work that you're doing on these issues. They're obviously uh, not of your making or indeed of the, uh, of the minister. Uh, but uh, my family business are uh, involved in, in selling tobacco products, and uh, recently the tobacco companies have announced that. They were having to change packaging on certain on their products uh, that were coming in the Northern Ireland. It's going to be different packaging, different health messaging than what was on uh, the products that were in sale in GB. And as a result of that, they dropped a lot of their brands because it just simply wasn't cost effective for them to uh, create new production lines uh, to meet the demands of, 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 of selling the products in Northern Ireland. Is there a danger, Cathy, that the pharmaceutical companies that at the end of the day they're not charities uh that they will do something similar to what the tobacco companies have done that they will simply reduce the availability of of products um if they become it's not cost effective uh, to uh, produce them to send in the northern ireland uh, and you have alluded uh, earlier that there will be uh, obviously cost implications but probably quite substantial cost implications we don't know what they are yet uh, but they are going to take away a uh, valuable budget from other aspects of, of NHS work. Uh, and could you confirm, Cathy, over-the-counter products, which are obviously a, a big part of a, a, a pharmacist sales, um, could, could the, the, uh, the choice be impacted on, on over-the-counter products? But more importantly, um, can you envisage that there will be 
uh, price increases on these products. And uh, finally, uh, are we going to be totally dependent on the EU for our ongoing supply of medicines? And, and given our failures around the procurement of uh, COVID vaccines, uh, that situation would not exactly fill me with uh, any great level of, of confidence. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for your questions. Um, so I think it's too early to say uh, and to provide uh, a sort of categorical advice in terms of what the impact's going to be in terms of product availability and price at the moment. What we think, those are both risks, definitely, that um, companies could reduce their product range and also the prices could increase. They are risks. But I have to say, they are risks that exist without any mitigation. And we are working really actively with industry at the moment to work through this and to maintain and go back to those principles I said earlier, to maintain access to supplies and also equitable access for our citizens. So a huge amount of work going on in there. But yes, those are the sorts of issues that companies will be considering around product ranges and also costs. Um, OTC medicines will also be impacted by this. So a lot of the similar issues, the issues that I've discussed would, would have an impact on them as well to, to, to some extent. Uh, you asked, are we going to be fully reliant on EU supplies? Uh, again, it's too early to say because the industry are really just beginning to make changes and make their own decisions. So we, I, I couldn't say for definite, um, you know, to what to what extent we will be relying on EU or still GB based supplies or others. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Alan. And now we're going across to our Deputy Chair, Pam Cameron. Go ahead, Pam, please. Thank you, Colm, and um, apologies for the lateness. I did miss um, almost the entirety of, of the presentation, so I do apologise. I got caught behind a, an accident on the way in. Um, thank you, Cathy, uh, Patricia, and team um, for the for your ongoing work on this subject. I know it is a very complex issue, and I do appreciate the, the work you're doing on it. Um, I suppose my um, questions are more generic. Um, I would like, Cathy, if you could give us um, what your early readout is of the protocol with respect to the flow of medicines, medical devices, blood and tissue and clinical trials. Um, and can you tell us if the, if the one-year derogation, if, if it's working as envisaged or if there have been teething problems? Um, and is that agreement, is it, is it uh, preventing customs controls from kicking in on the GBMI? movements of medicines and vaccines? Um, uh, sir, I mean, in terms of early readout of the Northern Ireland Protocol, I think that uh, the main thing is now that there is a, um, that there is a much uh, greater awareness that there are long-term um, implications in relation to supply chains for uh, for medical goods. Um, that, that that is still, I think, that awareness is still growing. To be on, to be fair, and uh, and there's going to be probably more focus on it uh, in the near future. But um, so there's much more awareness. First of all, that the longer term change is needed, and I can see now that there definitely within the industry there's a lot of. Um, decisions starting to be made and there's our great will to make changes and move into a new, you know, whatever the new way of working needs to be uh, in, in the future. So I can see that people are working towards solutions. Um, at government level, we're working very, very closely with all stakeholders um, and really trying to understand how best to intervene and what mitigations will have the most impact. So that's still very a very active piece of work, still work in progress. So still, I think it feels early. It's a massive change. It feels early. We're only a few months into it. I think the monumental scale of this change is beginning to hit home uh, and uh, across the board. And I hope that that message does. Um, you know, obviously we have indicated at EU level that more time may be needed. I think that that's highly, uh, highly, highly realistic at this stage because I, I can see the amount of work and how serious these issues are being taken. So it is not a matter of people avoiding or using 12 months as a, you know, a period of time where they won't be making a start until December. There's a lot of th thinking going on here, a lot of legal advice from com among companies and logistics advice. 
um, the one year derogation really is helping us. Uh, it means that we have uh, we, we you know we have minimal impact in on our supply chain. Uh, we have some issues that I've referred to in previous answers, uh, you know, and some issues in relation to um, one issue relating to um, uh, uh, radio uh, radio pharmaceuticals, for example, that has which which has been um, uh, there's been a diversion of our supply chain up through the Republic of Ireland, which has caused some issues for patients in uh, the Northwest and in Belfast since January. So, other than so the other than those sort of cases, I think the one year derogation has been very very beneficial. And um, Cathy, just on that, was in terms of uh, customs controls, uh, has the derogation has that prevented those controls from kicking in? In terms of movements of medicines and vaccines, it 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 has allowed us more. To, there there are custom controls in place for medicines at the moment, um, but what? But the. The twelve-month grace period has given us more time, specifically relating to um, batch testing, which needs to happen at product level for medicines now moving from GB into Northern Ireland. There's no facility at the moment for that. At the moment, it just doesn't exist because we're all part of the same market. So, that, yes. So I suppose that that would have had to come in in place without the derogation. That would have become in place on, in January, but we simply wouldn't have been ready. So I don't think it's delayed it as such. Um, I think it's given us more time to think through what's the best way to handle these issues, and also some of those some of those things rely we are relying on the advice of our regulator and also the interpretation of the EU. So potentially there are there are more problems and issues to come. I suppose is what I'm getting to in that. There's last. there. The, I mean, in terms of the movement between GB and Northern Ireland, there are batch testing and verification checks that are on hold at the moment, and they are they are one of the major um, challenges that the pharmaceutical industry are flagging in terms of their ability to maintain the GB to Northern Ireland routes, um, and and one of the reasons why many companies are considering alternative routes through the Republic of Ireland and direct to Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Um, and finally, for me, um, Cathy, I wanted to know if there if there've been any problems in relation to reciprocal healthcare since the first of January, or uh, I suppose is there is the fuller picture maybe not possible because of the the COVID travel restrictions that have been in place. Um, we're not aware of any um, difficulties at the moment um, around reciprocal healthcare. Um, obviously, there haven't been a lot of people movement um, to sort of see whether or not the the ability to use um, EHIX and GHIX is in, in sort of within the rest of Europe is being um, agreed. Uh, but within Northern Ireland sort of coming in, we're not expecting there to be any difficulties. The, uh, the BSO for GP registration and the um, the the trusts in terms of secondary care are all very well well aware of the um the provisions and we've been working with them to sort of make sure that they're aware of what's happening and what and how they apply those provisions um i think you may find when people are going abroad there may be some instances where um there may be some confusion in other jurisdictions um and i think that's part partly for the NHS Business Services Authority that is um, manages those um, reciprocal healthcare provisions on behalf of the UK as a whole. It's it's for them then to, to sort of bottom out the operational issues that occur for patients when they're in another EU country. Okay, thank you, Patricia. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you, Cathy and Patricia um, and Emer. I know didn't didn't uh, didn't come in, but thank you for for being here this morning, Emer, as well. And I suppose there is there is a, a number of issues that are outstanding of grave concern, and I have to say these concerns are a result of Brexit. The protocol, the protocol has has largely been put in place because there were needed mitigations, and we've asked for grace periods in order to facilitate some of these transfers. But we are seeing increased difficulties for professionals working across, across the North and for recruitment as a result of Brexit, not a result of the protocol. We've been removed from the cross-border directive as a result of, of Brexit. 
And I think we do need to be honest within, within the committee in terms of that and deal with this realistically. These issues are not arising as a result of the protocol. The protocol, in fact, is providing some protections. Supply of medicines is under threat, and it clearly is under threat as a result of Brexit. And I think we have been saying now for, for quite some time that there is no good Brexit. Um, costs potentially are going to go up as a result of Brexit, not a result of any protocol. And finally, I suppose, and, and this is this is hugely concerning for people, is um, reciprocal health care and the European health care. That's being removed because of Brexit. And, and I mean, this, this is going to create significant difficulties for the department, for our society, and most importantly, I feel for people at the receiving end of all of this. So I, I do think this is going to need considerable further engagement with yourselves. I do appreciate your attendance at committee here this morning, um, once again, and your very, very fulsome answers were, were possible, and, and in most cases, in relation to, to many of the issues we're dealing with. However, the uncertainty remains remains a real concern, and I think that's that's going to be something that, that we will need to. So I, I, I anticipate that we will be um, looking at an updated briefing at some point from you again. But for now, Cathy and Patricia and Emer, I'd like to thank you for attending this morning, and I uh, appreciate you, you coming here. Gorame Agaf, Agus Begi Salam. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Okay, um, members, uh, any comments in relation to that other than um, I think we clearly do need to schedule in at some point an updated briefing that I, I would have, if anything, additional concerns as a result of today's meeting in terms of how this is all shaping up and the worst case scenarios that are potentially in front of us here. Um, any other thoughts or comments, members? Yes, Chair. Yeah, go ahead, Jonathan. No, Chair, listen, uh, and I, I listened to your commentary in relation to Brexit at the end, and that is from your perspective. But the reality here is, in relation to the aspect of this debate regarding medicine supply and medical devices supply in Northern Ireland, it is not Brexit that's the problem. It's the Northern Ireland Protocol. 98%, that was a staggering figure that Cathy suggested, is supplied from GB mainland into Northern Ireland. Their problems to date or the Northern Ireland Protocol. Therefore, our focus entirely from this committee and from the Northern Ireland Executive and from indeed Her Majesty's Government needs to be in tackling the protocol and its inequalities that are contained within. Because we all we have a serious issue coming down the line here. I, I want to know why the Minister will not take legal action in relation to the protocol to ensure that quality of access to treatment and services that Northern Ireland deserves. So, uh, you know, some may look at the protocol with rose-tinted glasses. I certainly will not. It creates barriers uh, and has a, a negative impact on the Northern Ireland economy and on the Northern Ireland uh, constituent in relation to its inability to access those services. So I have severe concerns. I think probably what we do need, I think we could all agree, is much more information regarding how those higher-level discussions are ongoing in relation to uh, an extension period or a, a mutual recognition. That's just my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Uh, I also have my hand raised, Chair. Yeah. yeah um, Carol, please. Sorry, Chair. Uh, well, we're not going to agree on Brexit. I mean, I firmly agree with your position, Chair, and it'll come as no surprise that this is all a result of Brexit. I don't have rose tinted glasses as a result of anything, but let's be honest here. Um, you wouldn't be in this position other than, you know, Brexit was voted through. Um, and had mitigations not been put in, God knows what would have happened. But I, I would like to see additional evidence. And, Chair, we are hearing this narrative from the Department about tackling waiting lists without any detail whatsoever. So maybe when we're mopping things up, we could try and ask about that. Because I think it just sounds to me, as a former minister, like lines to take without any detail. Gormagat. Yeah, going to Orlea and then Pam. Go ahead, Orlea. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I mean, listen, Kathy basically made it clear there, and it was in her own words, that, like, you know, the change is happening, and there is going to be major changes um, in relation to medicine and medical supplies and, and all of the rest, um, and, and that is as a result of, of Brexit. Um, but I think that there's a couple of points that we need to go back on, and I know that the Kathy and, and Patricia had agreed to, to come back to the committee with further updates, but I think in between time, it would be useful if we could um, write off to the department as a reminder, see on that point around the healthcare common frameworks, 
and on that fourth framework which work was basically suspended on that back in december um to quote the treasurer that says that no further action would be taken at this point um now the treasurer was saying that you know in, in relation to that that framework it's down to the, the devolved regions um as to some of that work that they progress and in the context of cross-border healthcare, I think we have a duty and responsibility to make sure that our Department of Health is doing all that it can um, to work on that, that framework. So now Patricia says that they are going to look at sort of reinvigorating that again and doing a bit of work on it. I just think it's important that we we'll, that we'll follow up on that. Um, thank you, Chair. Thanks, Olivia. And Pam? Thanks, Chair. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that uh, um, I think we need to be careful. Um, obviously, you as an individual chair have your comments to make and that's absolutely fine and, and right but i do think you need to be careful that when you're making um grand statements to officials who are presenting towards us that that is actually from you as an individual and not uh, stating a position of the committee as chair yeah and um, hopefully you'll do the same when you're speaking as deputy chair because you've made statements in the past yourself so as long as you apply the same rule across the board, will all be grand. Chair, are you trying the meeting or is Carol trying it? Um, yeah, we we will we will take all that into consideration. I have to say, um, there there are significant concerns here, and I don't think we can look at anything with rose tinted glasses. To be quite honest, and at 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 basic at basic here, I do firmly believe that Brexit is what is causing all this. If anything, the protocol is trying to provide some mitigations. And given that we are still in an ongoing negotiation with the European Union around the mitigations, I think we need to be cognizant of that fact. And I think that, that, that we as a committee actually need to ensure that the correct mitigations are, are secured and that we don't see any a fall off in supply of medicines that we limit it would appear the the cost increases which I, I think we're being told are going to be almost inevitable and um i think i think that's the, that's the real job of work that we as a committee need to do over the next period of time in relation to that i think uh, our members agreed that we will schedule another updated brexit briefing to keep uh, to keep track on these issues and how developments are going agreed agreed are members satisfied that we seek further information on the common frameworks as outlined by our lay there? Great. Yeah. And are members content to write to the minister asking for additional and specific information around the plan to deal with waiting lists, which are of a concern to all of us equally? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, members, I'm now going to take a, a very short break there. Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Alan. I think Alan has maybe yeah. indicated. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just, uh, I'm listening with interest uh, about the various comments about Brexit and what's to blame and so forth. Uh, my party uh, did, did not support, uh, in principle, uh, voting uh, for uh, Brexit. Uh, and indeed, uh, I voted uh, uh, to remain. Uh, once the decision was taken, the democratic decision was taken, then uh, I think uh, I would expect that all Democrats would have moved on then and accepted the, the democratic will of the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, but some people seem to still really want to fight that fight over again. But it, it's it's gone. Uh, Brexit, it's done. Um, the protocol, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, is what I see uh, as, as the difficulty at the moment. And uh, certainly if there was no border down in the RDC, and we didn't have this protocol, we actually wouldn't probably be having this debate this morning because there wouldn't be any issues or any problem. So um, I, I do think that there, there is um, immense work that needs to be done uh, on the on the protocol. Uh, and in fact, if the protocol was removed tomorrow, I think it would take a lot of these problems away. So that's, that, that's just where I stand, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, it, it, the next time we have Cathy back, I think it would be very useful to ask her if the protocol was removed, would the problems disappear? And and we, we remain we remain to see what is the case. However, I have to say, I suspect it wouldn't be as simple as that. And I think fundamentally, Brexit is what's creating these pressures. But anyway... I think, I think you have to accept the democratic will uh, of the people of the United Kingdom that voted for Brexit. Uh, and, you know, you, you can fight all your own little private wars you want, but the, the, the fact is the country voted for Brexit. That, that's the situation. 
that's the reality. Nothing's going to change that. Uh, so there we go. Well, with all with all due respect, I don't think anyone is fighting any private wars here. I think we as a committee are fighting to ensure that our population here who didn't vote for Brexit will continue to receive the medical care uh, that they need, the medicines that they need, the medical devices that they need. And I would sincerely hope that we will find some way to replace the things we have lost in terms of reciprocal health care and in terms of my and all of our constituents' ability to get treatment across Europe and across this island when I they need to be sure. I, I, uh, I, I see it and other people see it uh, that we can do that by removing the protocol. Uh, obviously, Chairman, you don't. And I respect your view and I hope that you would respect mine. Thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you, members. So I'm going to take a short break there now before we go on to our next session. Could, could I ask members to be back and ready to start again at 11.30? So 11.30 restart there, members. Thank you. Broadcast, can you take us off air, please? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Program Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, thank you, members. And we are now resuming with uh, our next substantive briefing, which is uh, a briefing on the Health and Social Care Board bill, which we are considering at present. 
So I can advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief us on the bill. I refer you members to tab papers at tab six of the pack, particularly the clerk's memo at tab 6.1 and to the departmental briefing paper, which is at tab 6.2. Chair, before you continue, yes. can I come in? Yes, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, I'm just very concerned about uh, some of the commentary there in the last session, at the end of the last session. And uh, Karen McCullen was, to my mind, accusing me of something in my time as, as Deputy Chair. I presume she's referring to something, uh, to a meeting that I've chaired or some comments I've made. And I don't know what she's talking about, but... She has made an accusation, and I would like that either withdrawn or addressed if she wants to explain herself. Okay, I'm going to go to Carol. My understanding was that she was asking that that would be the case if you were speaking as deputy chair, but I'll go to Carol. Yeah, and I don't uh, I don't uh, need to address myself to you or anybody else, Pam, but the chair is absolutely right. So if, uh, if it applies to the chair, it applies to you. And uh, you have made political comments in the past, as have we all. Okay, so Chair, Carl has just said it again. So every politician will make political com comments. If she's trying to exactly. say I misused my position as Vice Chair while chairing the Health Committee, that's what I want to clear up. You've never chaired a Health Committee in my time, Pam. Your time has been short. Yeah, exactly. Okay, members. Okay, um, so listen, you've you've raised the issue, Pam, and Carol has responded, and I'm going to move I'll on. Formally. I'll raise it formally. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so members, I would now like to welcome uh, departmental officials here to brief us on the health and social care bill. First of all, I'd like to welcome Mr. John Miller, uh, who's the health and social care bill team manager. Good morning, John. Are you able to hear us? Okay. Chair. Yes, Morning. thank you. You're very, you're very welcome, John. And Mr. Gareth McKeown, uh, who is in, involved in the Migration to Closure Project Team Manager. Morning, Are you able to hear us okay, morning. Gareth? Yep. Yep, thank you. And Mr. Alan Chapman, who is a Future Planning Model Planning Team Lead. Are you able to hear us as well there, Alan? Yes, Chair. Good morning. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, if I can just say in general to all of you, including the panel and members, if everyone can keep themselves on mute when they're not speaking, that, that would be helpful. It also is much better sound quality if people can make use of headsets or earphones. Um, so I would ask uh, members and panel to, to do that if possible. And also, if we could, uh, when we come to the question and answer session, I'll, I'll go back to John in terms of how you're going to handle the brief element of it. When it comes to question and answer session, if one of you could lead on the substantive answer, and then if there's additional information only, rather in terms of just facilitating time with, with, within our meeting this morning, we're already uh, running fairly significantly uh, over time as, as it is. So we'll try to keep it as brief and succinct to both panel and members, please, if possible. So, John, I'll, I'll come back to you there, and could you just outline how you're going to brief us, and then we can take the question and answer it after that. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the plan would be to um, provide, a, a hopefully, a relatively short opening statement. Um, the briefing has been provided, um, and we hope it was useful uh, to the committee. Uh, once the, the opening statement's done, we're quite happy to take uh, questions. Um, hopefully, uh, I'm quite happy to take the, the lead on most of them, depending on the question, but uh, we'll refer to uh, Gareth or Alan if it covers their speciality. Okay, thank you. Go ahead then, John. Thanks. Well, good morning, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to be here today to brief the committee about the Health and Social Care Bill. As you've already mentioned, uh, I'm the Bill Team Manager. Uh, as you've also said, I'm joined today by departmental colleagues Gareth and Alan. Um, uh, in terms of Gareth's uh, responsibility, he's team lead for the Migration to Closure Project. Uh, he deals with many practical elements involved in the closure of the board and Alan's the planning model team lead who is responsible for the recently commenced work on future planning. Uh, I hope the briefing paper provided prior to the session provide, provide, was useful and to begin I think it would be helpful to set out some high level information about the health and social care bill. Its objective is simple, it is to facilitate the closure of the health and social care board and the transfer of responsibilities for its functions in the main to the Department of Health. 
The planning assumption is that the board will close on the 31st of March 2022. Uh, staff of the board will at this point transfer to the business services organisation under a hosting arrangement as illustrated in the appendix to the briefing paper. Crucially, these staff will retain their HSC terms and conditions and will continue to undertake their current roles and functions as before, but as an integral part of the department and not as an arm's length body. They will be directed by the department and will be led by a senior civil servant at deputy secretary level. Now, to the bill itself. The Health and Social Care Bill seeks to provide the legislative framework for the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and the transfer of its functions. I will cover the essential elements of the proposed legislation and give an indication of what each will mean in practice. In terms of Clause 1, the dissolution of the Regional Health and Social Care Board, this clause provides for the dissolution of the board, which as a consequence will mean that local commissioning groups will cease to exist. There remains a statutory duty on the department to secure the commissioning of health and social care services and in doing so to set the priorities and the outcomes which the system is expected to deliver. Whilst the dissolution of the board will remove the requirement for local commissioning groups, it does not in any way detract for the need for local intelligence and input into the planning process. In practical terms, the department is planning for the regional board closure on 31st of March 2022. Local commissioning groups will remain in place until that date, which will mean that their input and influence will continue into the 2022-23 commissioning cycle. Beyond 22-23, the need for local input and intelligence into the planning process is recognised. And while the local commissioning groups will cease to exist, the local commissioning teams that are currently in the board will remain in place. The local commissioning teams are staffed by regional board staff, and their role includes the gathering, collation, input of local information to inform plans and maintaining effective working relationships with partners in their localities. These roles will continue beyond the closure of the regional board and as a consequence ensure there is no, degrada no degradation in the availability of local information to be considered in a commissioning cycle. In addition, Minister has recently approved a programme of work to develop a new way of planning services based on an integrated care approach. A key part of the process will be to engage with local commissioning groups to ensure key learning is incorporated into any new approach. If we can move on to clause two, it deals with the transfer of the regional board's functions. This clause introduces schedule one, which is the core of the bill. It details all the amendments that are required to existing legislation to achieve the transfers of powers duties and responsibilities as a consequence of the board's closure. The amendment to health specific acts and orders result in duties and responsibilities previously held by the board now being placed in the main directly upon the department. This includes commissioning, performance management and funding which will now sit with the department. It will also include contracts for primary medical practitioners, uh, GPs, dentists, pharmacists etc. Which will be the responsibility of the department. The bill also provides the department with regulation making powers to ensure that primary medical practitioners have access to an independent appeal process in the event of contractual disputes or other specified issues arising between the department and its primary medical practitioner contract holders. At this point, I'd like to turn to accountability within the new model. The senior civil servant directing former board staff will be accountable to the department's the permanent secretary for the delivery of the functions by the former board staff. The permanent secretary is accountable to the minister for the department's performance. The performance of and accountability for the functions under the direction of the senior civil servant will be subject to the same scrutiny as the rest of the department's business by the departmental board which includes non-executive members. In addition, the oversight of the Audit and Risk Assurance Committee will extend to those functions which are now under the direction of the senior civil servant. The Department's Audit and Risk Assurance Committee membership includes two non-executive members of the Departmental Board and a further two independent external members. The senior, ser senior civil servant will be a member of the Department's top management group, chaired by the Permanent Secretary, which meets weekly to discuss the work of the Department. 
Turning to the functions going to the trusts, a new Article 10A of the Health and Personal Social Services Northern Ireland Order 1991 is detailed in the Bill. This article provides a definition of what is included in social care and children's functions and is a list of the functions that are largely currently with the regional board but are or already exercised by trusts through responsibility being delegated from the regional board to the trusts. The bill will seek these functions placed directly on trusts, but the oversight of the exercise of these functions is currently carried out within the social care and children directorate of the regional board. Following the closure of the board, oversight will continue to be undertaken by the same staff, though as an integral part of the department. The bill provides for the department to be directly responsible for the oversight of the trust exercise of these functions. Oversight will be facilitated by regular ongoing performance reporting by the trust to the department. In addition, the bill provides the trust must, at the very least, annually submit a scheme detailing how they are exercising social care and children functions to the department for its approval. Moving to clause three. Schemes for transfers of assets and liabilities. In order to help affect the dissolution of the board in practical terms, this clause places a duty on the department to make one or more schemes for the transfers of the board's assets, including their staff and its liabilities. Transfer schemes for staff have been used on many occasions in the past. In this case, all the staff of the board will transfer to the business services organization However, they will be directed by the department and be led by a senior civil servant. No former board staff will be dispersed to HSC Trusts, public health agency, or any other health body as a consequence of the closure of the board. This approach, while streamlining structures and reducing bureaucracy, will also provide the flexibility for the work on the new planning approaches to evolve, and importantly, through their employment with the business services organization, the former board staff will retain their HSC terms and conditions, and further, no staff will be made redundant. Active engagement with board staff has been and can, continues to be a fundamental part of the transition process to closure. Consultation with staff and or the representatives will be a key part of the development and operation of the transfer scheme for staff. Moving to clause four. Clause 4 introduces Schedule 3, which ensures an ordered winding up of the board and provides mitigating legislative provision to address the potential risk to the continued operation of the health and social care system following the closure of the board. A power is included here to provide for regulation to be made, if required, to address any non-alignment of existing legislation not already identified as a consequence of the closure of the board and commencement of the new arrangements. Again, this is not novel or contentious and was evident in the 2009 Reform Act, which provided for the dissolution of a number of health bodies and the transfer of their legislative functions at that time. Schedule 3 places a duty on the department to make arrangements for a statement of final accounts of the board and together with a report from the Auditor and Controller General, these must be laid with the Assembly. It also provides provisions to ensure continuity in terms of previous directions issued to and by the board. If this provision was not in place, every direction ever issued to the regional board would cease to have effect from the closure of the board, leading to potentially significant implications for ongoing service delivery. In addition, the department may continue anything being done by or to the board, including legal proceedings following the closure of the board. It is important to highlight this fact. Anything that was commenced with the regional board before closure, including legal action or relation to staff, or assets and liabilities becomes the responsibility of the department upon closure. Clauses 5, 6 and 7 are standard interpretation, commencement and short title clauses. Clause 5 provides interpretation for a number of references made in the bill, for example, to what terms department, regional board and the 1972 refer. Clause 6 provides that the department may appoint on which day some clauses of the bill come into force. Provisions within this bill will come into operation either with royal assent or commence on a date to be decided by the department. It is the department's intention that clause one, that's the dissolution of the board, and clause two and schedule one, which transfers the functions of the board, will be commenced from the 31st of March, 2022. 
This, of course, is subject to successfully completing the legislative process. The commencement date has been chosen to mitigate against a number of potential risks, such as complications associated with a closure partway through a financial year, which could lead to a double running of systems and double accounting requirements. The proposed closure date will minimise any potential issues with governance and accountability arrangements as well. You'll see that this date, however, is not stated within the bill. The alternative of including a fixed date in legislation provides for an unnecessary element of risk. These risks could include unforeseen delays in legislative progression, leading, the bill not, leading to the bill not securing all necessary approvals, including royal assent by a fixed date. And then finally, Clause 7 is the title by which the ensuing Act will be known. In this case, the title of the Act will be the Health and Social Care Act, Northern Ireland 2021. And finally, moving on to new regula regulation making powers. I've made a couple of references to powers being included in the bill, specifically powers to provide for regulations to be made if necessary to address any non-alignment of existing statutory legislation not already identified and powers to allow the department to ensure primary med medical practitioners have access to an independent appeals process. The delegated powers memorandum previously provided to committee details in, in total six new departmental regulation making powers. The other new regulation making powers allow the department to make regulations to amend the list of social care and children functions conferred directly on trusts to make regulations so that the department's power to give directions and guidance may apply to a substituted body or person to whom the department has directed the exercise of social care and children functions should those functions be removed from a HSC trust. To make regulations to amend any statutory provisions as necessary to facilitate and safeguard the exercise of social care and children functions by a substituted body or person following the removal of those functions from a, a trust should that be necessary, and to make regulations to amend any statutory provisions as necessary to facilitate the ex exercise of functions delegated to trusts. Finally, it will be clear to members at this point that this bill is relatively straightforward and is objective, though technical in nature. The closure of the board is a step forward as we seek to reduce the bureaucracy and complexity so keenly associated with the health and social care system. It is only a first step which will enable a better focus of resources and enable the system to operate more effectively and efficiently. And finally, I hope you feel that this summary was useful and we're happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Gorham Agat Marshin. That was useful indeed. Um, and I suppose, first of all, from my point of view, you had you had mentioned there, and, so, and you went into some detail around the whole local commissioning groups. Now, early early in my career, my appointment as an MLA, I attended a couple of the local commissioning group meetings that were taking place in the constituency, and I have to say that I found them useful in a sense. Although I thought there was there was huge room for improvement in terms of co-production and co-design. Um, you know, members of the public were entitled to attend the meetings, but weren't entitled to contribute. Uh, there was very tightly defined speaking speaking uh, procedures and things like that, which I thought kind of restricted a debate and, and inclusion and co-production in that sense. However, there was a very welcome uh, safeguard in that local councillors were represented as of right on that group, were entitled to speak and engage and represent their, their communities and their needs on the local commissioning groups. So I would have hoped as a result of this change that we would have looked at strengthening the local commissioning element of this uh, in a way which would open out to co-production to other people, provide communities with the ability to genuinely engage in the discussions, both the tough discussions around what is available and how, how you make a finite budgets cover everything, but also to indicate what their priorities would be now, I am a bit concerned at some of the things you said, but also this is in the context of some concern I have around the minister's statement on Tuesday in the Assembly. And one of the things that I picked up on was where he stated that the cancer strategy had been co-produced with the Health and Social Care Board and Health Trusts. Now, I would contend that that is actually 
just necessary planning with the people who are directly involved. To me, that's not co-production. Co-production should involve staff representatives, should involve allied health professionals if they're, if they're relevant, should involve community organizations. So I'm, I'm concerned that the, the praise of co-production, and I think it is a praise in the sense, it's not to me a chore, it's a praise in the sense that the people who have many of the solutions want to be part of the conversations. So in light of that, the fact that you said that, that uh, local commission groups will continue on until 2023 cycle, however, then the local commissioning teams which currently exist in the department will basically uh, take over the function in discussion with the people who had previously been on the local commissioning groups. Now that to me, I have to say, strikes me as bringing commissioning back in house rather than opening it out more to the community. And I, I would have a concern about that. So how is, how, how are local, you know, what will the relationship be with the local commission team and the people they're speaking to? What will the, what will their, uh, what will their right be to impact on decision making or will they just be consulted with and then either, either taken, taken on board or not as the local commissioning team within the department might choose? Chair, um, I also reflected on the fact that, that there's a, a new approach. Uh, the, the Minister has uh, commissioned work to take forward a new approach. Um, a key part of this process will be to engage with local commissioning groups to ensure key learning in terms of that new approach. Um, and that new approach will uh, not only take account of the key, key learning from the LCGs, but also the changed landscape in which we're now op operating with the creation of community planning partnerships and how we can better align ourselves to achieve improved outcomes for our local populations. Um, if yeah. I could add in, John, as well, um, it's it's important to note that the future planning uh, work that we're undertaking is looking at what comes in place um, alongside, as John mentioned, the, the staff that will be retained with, from the board that currently work within local commissioning um, groups and teams. The future planning work will also look at what else comes alongside that. Um, I suppose similar in a vein to what exists in terms of the local commissioning group and the, a body that is representative of, of partners from across the sector, um, including voluntary and community sector and, and the, the service users uh, and carers. Um, the idea being to, to build a, a broader system that does allow for that local input and local intelligence both from the data and evidence that's available through through the likes of, of professionals and, and statistics, but also from local communities and individuals as to what their health needs are and to ensure that we create a system where that is, is fed into how priorities are determined uh, and how services are planned and delivered. Um, and that is part of the future plan and work that we're now starting to take forward. Yeah, but, and, I, and I accept that. And I did note your, your, your reference to an integrated cure approach and that is all remains to be seen how that develops. But what we know for sure is that the local commissioning groups are going to be done away with. And I'm wondering, is that is that necessary? Could those not have been retained and their expertise, which you're now seeking to consult and capture, why not retain that until such times as we could see the, uh, the picture as to what was going to replace them and indeed how it was going to be improved? I think the, the intention is that we, this work will start now um, on, on what comes behind LCGs. And it's important, as, as John's referenced there, we're not doing it in isolation by ourselves. Uh, we, we've established a project board and it includes representation from, from LCGs. And we'll be looking to work closely with LCGs on, on how to make this um, move forward. Uh, but to build basically on what they have, have done um, to date, like you say, and, and, and previous review of commissioning hinted at um, the LCGs have had limitations as well uh, in what they've been able to achieve, but they've also provided us with really good foundations to build on. And the intention would be that whatever mechanisms we're bringing in place under the future planning model, whilst a fully fledged integrated care system takes time uh, and we'll, we'll have to do in a phased approach, they will be in place uh, from the date of closure. Okay, and what what appeals process will be in place at that point around commissioning decisions, either decisions taken or decisions not taken? What appeals process is being built into into this bill or into the arrangements going forward? 
I'm not sure if, if there's anything specific in the in the bill. Um, in terms of appeals, um, I, I would need to come back to you to to look at the the existing sort of mechanisms in place uh, that operate currently and how they'll possibly be brought forward and, and integrated into the new new operating model. Okay, thank you. And I, I would I would like I would like it if you would come back to us as a committee with that, Alan. Yes, thank sir. you. Okay, my final Chair, one before sorry, I go to, can I just yes, clarify? Chair, go sorry, ahead, I just clarify. In terms of the bill, um, going going back to the basic principles, the basic principles of the bill are to close the board and transfer the functions. So uh, the the details you've asked for are not included in in this primary legislation. They will be for the work that Alan is doing in terms of taking that forward. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the the final well, is there any reason why they couldn't be part of the bill? Uh, they they they're not part of the scope of the bill. Um, I'm sure the health committee uh, were to recommend that that would be something we would the minister would have to consider. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, John. So the final one for me then before I go to members is in relation to engagement with staff and unions uh, in relation to the transfer of staff. What engagement has there been with the staff and the unions in relation to uh, the, the future and how the move is going to be um, coordinated? Uh, sure, I'll, I'll take this one. So um, I, I, as John has said out, uh, the, the vast majority um, of the work of this project, uh, the, the functions are transferring, but this is all around the people side of things. Um, in, in terms of setting up the project, we have 16 strands covering the various functions. And within each of those 16 strands, we have a trade union representative embedded uh, in the strands. Uh, we've established a staff side forum. So we meet every six to eight weeks. Uh, so. All, all the relevant trade unions are there with management side in the project. Um, in terms of uh, HR communications, th th that's at the forefront of this. We have an ambition program, um, which is setting to build capacity capability amongst the staff. We have a people strategy in, in place to support them through the transition. Uh, so what are, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? How does it impact you? Uh, so this is all very clearly communicated to staff at, at various levels, chief executive to all staff, smaller groups, one-to-one -one sessions, and those communications were, were two-way engagement. So, uh, for example, today we were running a session where staff could input into the naming of the, the future group within the department. Uh, so, so the staff engagement, the trade union engagement is absolutely hand in glove throughout this. Okay, thank you, and that, that's uh, that, that's uh, I think the right approach, and I think a valuable approach. So thank you for that, Gareth. Okay, I'm going to go to members now. So at this point in time, I'm going first of all to Carol Nicholin, then Carol Hunter, Jerry Carroll, Paula Bradshaw, and Orlea Flynn. So that's the order I have at present. Uh, so go ahead there, Carol, please. So um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, John. Um, and the rest for just uh, and Alan in particular for out outlining the scope of the bill. I suppose the church covered a lot of questions, but I do think it is worth considering. While I appreciate this is a technical seven clause bill, which is dealing with the scope of the abolition of the board. Um, the questions that were raised, I think, need to be reflected somewhere. Um, so, for example, you know, when we're transferring the local commissioning groups, although they'll be there until 22, 23. I think that needs to be better explained and what, what it means. So it could be amending the explanatory note, but it, it definitely needs to be fed in. The other aspect of it is that this may be already answered, but if clauses one and two are going ahead, um, then the rest of the clauses are almost dependent that relate to the transfer functions three and four, they're dependent on dissolution of the board. The local commissioning groups are still operational. So maybe that could be explained or is it all going to be done in one fell swoop? And then the last question I have is you did allude to the issue around talking to trade unions and staff side representatives in this. And I noted some of the previous comments I made when this was first um, announced 
but what are the, the current um, issues, given that BSO will retain all the health and social care staff, but what are the current arrangements in relation to ensuring that whatever is commissioned, it reflects the needs of that geographical area? Uh, because that is not clear from what we've seen up until now. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead, John. Sorry, yeah, um, uh, the member's um, question around the commencement of the bill. Um, I think uh, from memory, only clause one and clause two um, are at the discretion of the department. The other clauses in terms of um, having to have a transfer scheme in place um, and the um, transitional arrangements, they all come in with royal assent. And as I explained in, hopefully explained uh, in uh, my opening remarks, uh, clause one and clause two are there. Uh, the plan is for the department to commence those on the 31st of March, 2022. Uh, the reason they're not in the bill as a fixed date is because um, there are things that are outside the department's control in terms of the legislative process uh, and uh, the period required to get royal assent. So if we put that date fixed in the bill, if that happens, then it has major implications for the for the those provisions within the bill. That's a very technical explanation. Yeah, I appreciate that, John. But at the end of the day, um, the principle should be that all the clauses are um, subject to whatever happens. And I, I think given that kind of carte blanche authority to the department um, is, is okay, but up until a point, I, I think because it's too technical, then it almost becomes confused. So I think we need some more clarity around that. Okay, okay thank you. Um, yep, so going then to uh, Cara Hunter. Cara, go ahead, please. Thank you, Chair, and I'd like to thank the panel uh, this morning uh, for being here. <clears throat> My question, um, the Chair had raised uh, around, uh, you know, staff and unions, um, so thank you for raising that important point. But um, my questions refer to future planning, um, and I've raised this previously at, at the committee. I have real concern around regional imbalance being based in a rural constituency, and I know other MLAs are too. Uh, can I ask <clears throat> what assurances you will give um, to ensure that rural and regional balance um, services will be evenly distributed across the north <clears throat> and off the back of that we know that accessibility to healthcare is vital um, and there's a number of barriers such as uh, you know travel and transport so can I ask um, you know as we build a new system what steps or what considerations have been given um, to accessibility especially for um, more vulnerable groups like older people or people based in a rural community thank you Uh, thanks. Um, just on the the regional side of things that you, you raised there, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, it was it the the purpose of the future plan and model will be to actually go down the um, sort of principles of local level decision making. And as the model develops, and I would stress that it, it will take time to develop um, to this point, but it would increase uh, the autonomy at a local area level to make decisions around planning and services um, for their area and to meet their needs. Um, and it'll be based on a population health needs assessment approach. Um, so that that that'll both look at what, what we need regionally in Northern Ireland as a whole, um, which will obviously feed in and, and, and inform the, the objectives and priorities that, that are set. But also we will look to develop the, the ways to drive that detail down into what is actually needed at local level so that decisions then can be made by local area uh, areas, whether they be rural or urban or, or wherever they're situated as to what the services are needed to suit their population and, and even within segments of their own population. Um, so that would be there. Uh, there will always be a need, to, um, I think, to look at, at, at certain services on a regional level, the specialist services, so that will be built into the, the future plan model as well. Um, and there will need to be a bit of work done on, on what falls to local and what falls to regional. And like I say, as the as the systems mature, you should find that actually the the, the services the, the decisions will increase at a local level as the as their maturity increases and uh, the autonomy level will increase with that. 
Um, in terms of the transport issue, again, that links to getting down to that um, local area decision making and the integrated care system approach um, that has been developed elsewhere and is, is, is a model trying to be adopted across the world, really, but it, there's no blueprint for it. But one of the key aspects is it, that it, it sort of looks to break the local areas up into, into certain population sizes sections. Um, and, and again, th that we will be looking to build a, like a similar type of approach um, that would allow for the likes of the needs of particularly if you have a particular rural area that they can, you know, they can look at what is needed to service them to get the, the, the services that they need, which could include particular transport needs and that they can build that into their planning approaches. That's great, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, I think that kind of local expertise uh, and that insight is, is really important moving forward. But no, I'm happy with that. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. And going then to Jerry, Carol. Go ahead, Jerry, please. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Um, two main questions. Uh, the first are in transfer of staff. Um, I think it was John who said that the um, staff will retain their HSC terms and conditions. Um, will that be indefinitely? Is there a time frame put on that, uh, or what is the uh, process in regards to that? Um, and, and is it the case that all the staff um, here uh, were previously employed by the board are going to be employed by BSO, by the department, by a combination of both, uh, or what is the, the sort of the fine detail um, of that? So that's my first question. Thanks. If if I could take I that one. To... Oh, sorry, John. do oh, go ahead, Gareth. Go ahead. Um, so in terms of staff uh, transfer, retaining the terms and conditions, BS, uh, so for 1st of April 22, BSO will take on those employment contracts as they are, whatever the terms and conditions are within it. Um, if they're fixed term permanent, those conditions will exactly um, carry over. So um, there, there's no time frames around that. If they're permanent members of staff, they, you know, re retain uh, uh that, that status uh, so, so there's no change it's a uh, transfer from one organization to another um, in terms of all staff going to BSO yes all, all staff within the the board will transfer to BSO via transfer scheme set out in the provisions of the bill okay thanks and I would hope that their their conditions are maintained and um, there isn't a a thought process about uh, relying on agency staff because I think at times the BSO has relied on uh, agency staff too heavily so I hope there's not a repeat of that. Um, just final question, um, I don't know who's able to answer it but I think it's relevant to this discussion. I mean there's a perception amongst a lot of people that you know the the, the department is, is too top heavy in terms of too many uh, senior um, staff, senior management uh, in the department specifically. There's also a perception that you know when patients uh, are failed or there's questions around you know many different inquiries and issues that there's a, a culture of um, either not disclosing information or not a culture of transparency and, and uh, people often feel that they aren't getting the answers that they deserve you know being taxpayers and being people who are entitled to a proper healthcare treatment I think that's essential so what what assurances um, can we have with this bill uh, with the new uh, transfer of powers and functions to the Department of Health, there isn't going to be a repetition uh, of that approach where there are feelings and there likely is to be feelings with any organisation that people aren't um, either concerned or ignored and aren't uh, shut out from asking any questions. Thanks. Sorry, in terms, in terms of the transfer of functions, those, func those functions go directly to the department. Um, I, I am sure um, uh, members of the general public can, uh, you know, what they will actually see is um, the delivery of those services will largely continue as they are with with the trusts, with the primary uh, medical practitioner contractor. So in terms of the actual frontline delivery of those services, they won't see any difference with the transfer of those functions. Um, in terms of complaint procedures, FOIs, all that kind of thing, they will remain as they are. 
uh, in terms of being able to access that information and raise complaints and queries and questions. Um, I, I'm sure as MLAs, you'd be quite happy to hear that in terms of you raising those questions, those will come directly into the department and you'll get those answers, um, hopefully a little bit quicker than you do now, say that we don't have to go to a board, they, it will all be captured within the department. Thanks, John. I just, I just hope that's the case and I hope that, you know, when there are concerns or queries that people do get answered and, and there isn't a, you know, a, an approach uh, which is very defensive and, and ignores people's concerns, which unfortunately uh, has happened too many times. But I appreciate your, your answers, uh, panel. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thanks, Jerry And Paula Bradshaw, go ahead, Paula, please. Um, thank you, Chair, and thank you, panel, for the update this morning. I suppose some of the issues that I raised previously around accountability and oversight you, you have touched upon today, and that um, oversight and audit risk committee uh, is very much welcomed, um, especially the two external uh, people on that. So um, I suppose my questions today, therefore, are in relation to where there are feelings within commissioning of services at the minute. Um, and, um, and then just linking that into the trust, like for example, this week I got some figures from the Department of Health stating that there are no endometriosis um, specialist surgeons and I think 0.8% um, of an um, endometriosis specialist consultant or all the way around surgeon. But anyway, the point is that the trusts are failing in many ways, even whenever the services have been commissioned. So how is this new system going to improve that? Because I'm concerned that the permanent secretary and a senior management board will be interested in the big ticket items, the cancers and the stroke and diabetes, whenever there's some very, very small issues there that are being, uh, sorry, conditions that are being failed at the minute. So that's the first question. Thank you. Um, in terms of commissioning, commissioning will be done uh, initially by the department as those functions come in. Uh, the senior civil servant will be responsible for all those functions um, that have come into the department, uh, including commissioning. Uh, the, her link into the department is through the uh, top management group, where the permanent secretary uh, and the uh, executive board members sit on a weekly basis and discuss uh, work both um, in terms of corporate business and the handling of emerging, emerging issues. Okay, well, if we th thank you, but if we look at what happened with the pediatric cardi um, cardiac, uh, sorry, the pathology um, issue a few years ago, part of the reason why we lost the service here in Northern Ireland and it's now over in Alderhey is because the vacancy was allowed to um, come about and then there were delays then in filling it. And again, um, with the vacancy now in the Belfast Trust, for example, around endometriosis um, in the last um, few weeks. You know, what penalty or, or what safeguards or what measures are going to be, be put in place so whenever they're commissioned from the Department of Health of the trusts that we don't see these failings again and then we are, are allowing um, services in our trust to fester to the point that they actually have to close down, especially, again, these ones where there's limited numbers. It's not the big ticket stuff. In, in terms of the bill, I, I can't give the member a, an absolutely 100% guarantee. That would be foolish for me to do. But in terms of what the bill delivers, it takes away the middleman in terms of the board. And uh, performance management will be directly between the trusts and the department. Under the new arrangement, there will be no middleman. The board won't be there. Those discussions will have to take place directly between the department and the trusts. Okay, well, I think I'll raise this at, at, at the, um, in the, in the um, debate in the chamber. I'll, I'll, lift, I'll raise that directly with the health minister. But I suppose that the second part of the information that I received this week around endometriosis is, is that different trusts are recording um, their waiting lists differently. And we see there, again, this week, the health minister was talking about the regionalisation prioritisation list. How can we have... Um, a, a list that is robust around clinical need whenever the five different trusts are recording um, their patients differently. And again, is there the opportunity through this bill to tidy that up so that um, where we're dealing with apples and apples and not apples and oranges across the trust? Thank you. In terms of the primary legislation, the primary legislation uh, sets out the framework uh, in terms of where those functions lie. The details probably in regulations 
uh, at a lower level. So, you know, that that's probably the avenue where that kind of thing uh, would have to be addressed. Uh, but but in terms of the uh, the de detail of, of your question, um, uh, I, I wouldn't have those facts and figures. I'm quite happy to take them away and, and respond. No, I appreciate that, and, and um, I suppose, as you say, it's quite a high level um, and possibly a question outside the scope of it, but I think these are the practical implications in terms of how we ensure that, um, going back to Cara's point there, for example, is that we don't have regional variations across the trust, and so that when, going forward, there's an opportunity to actually improve performance across the whole of Northern Ireland, but I appreciate your time on the bill and at the committee today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Paula. And then uh, the last indication I have at this point in time is from Orlea Flynn. So go ahead, Orlea, please. Thanks, Colm. Um, thanks to the panel. My first question is um, maybe for Alan um, and then one or two for, for John afterwards. So just to go back to the um, the future planning team, Alan, and, you know, it's already been mentioned about the importance of that local input and intelligence from local community. So I know that you were saying earlier that obviously these things will take time to develop, um, but that this is part of your, your future planning work. Um, and you had says that so you are going to be starting to take that type of work forward where you're doing that engagement with the local communities. And I'm just wondering, um, Alan, do you have, you know, like um, a timeline set out for that engagement process or, you know, any sort of structured program of work how you're going to get into the local communities and have that engagement um to, to get their input hi thanks um we do have uh, been working on a communications and engagement strategy looking at in terms of of the broader project um going forward who we need to engage with with a, a, at best indicative timings in terms of who we would think um would need engaged and at, at what stage um, and I mean, that's su it's subject to change depending on how things progress. Um, in terms of the actual model itself, one of the key areas will be looking at, at community um, engagement uh, and, and, and how that feeds into the model going forward. And that'll be, it'll be a bit longer term. Um, again, no specific timeline, because we have to start to actually look at uh, how we actually go about that. What is the right approach? We are engaging with um, uh, and a we've got a meeting today with the integrated care partnership third sector steering group so that, you know we're starting to have discussions with with some organizations in that area um to see how engagement would work for them um how we can facilitate and enable that uh, maybe utilize what is already in place uh, such as the steering group and i think they have the wider forum in place there similarly with community and planning partnerships have a, a, a voluntary and third sector um structure in place and we need to consider how how we don't overly burden um that sector with with another um project coming along looking to do something different but we'll maybe look to utilize the the options between us there and i mean wider community engagement go forward in terms of actually planning services that's that's the key to to find out how we actually embed that um that will actually take a, a much longer period but it's useful to note that this type of thing does happen now, um, possibly not system-wide, uh, as, as we hope to get to, but uh, an example is, is the work going on in Western Trust. They've done a lot of engagement recently um, with community level up um, to determine needs and, and, and looking at uh, multi-morbidities. Uh, and so there is there is mechanisms that have been developed um, and, and examples of best practice, if you like, that we can build upon as well. Um, so no set timeline. The engagement will, uh, in terms of the development of the model, will happen reasonably quickly um, because, as I referred to before, we want this uh, in place for closure, so that, that will ramp up um, reasonably quickly and uh, includes such as the meetings today. And then the, the wider development of community involvement and engagement through the, the model itself will, will, will happen over the next um, 12, 18, 24 months. And it'll be a case of probably looking to constantly improve on that. Uh, and support the community to engage. Uh, and an example being the voluntary and community sector is broad and wide, and it's very difficult to turn around and say, give us one representative that can sit on this group and, and, and cover off all concerns, issues, or, or expertise you could bring to the table. So we have to look at ways of, of trying to support them uh, and what works for them as well. 
Okay, I don't know that that's useful. It would be it would be good if um the committee. I know obviously all those timings are going to be indicative for you, but if we could get you know maybe regular updates on how you are getting on with that communication and engagement process. Um, thank you for that. And then John, um, just to bring it back to um one of the questions that was raised earlier around, I think it might have been the chair raised it around is there any scope um within the bill to look at an appeals process for commissioning decisions um and you had answered that the current need there is no scope within the bill for that um but in your earlier remarks you had mentioned that you are looking at um an independent appeals process for around the contracts for primary the primary medical practitioners so is there scope within the bill then at present around that appeals process for the primary medical practitioners and if so you know does that mean that you know it is a possibility that we could try and you know um expand that scope to take in the commissioning decisions i, I would um suggest at this point there there are two radically different things um there is already an existing relationship with the uh, primary medical providers in terms of they are contracted and that contract sits with the board uh, if I could explain the process at the moment, um, if the board in monitoring performance decides that an individual practitioner isn't living up to the service contract or delivering what they're supposed to be delivering, then they will make a decision to, um, depending on the seriousness of the of the um, uh, lack of delivery, uh, they will either place a penalty on the payments out or they could uh, seek to go further in terms of the uh, inclusion of that practitioner on the list uh, for um, practitioners in Northern Ireland. Um, so that would be initial decision made by uh, the board. Um, obviously the practitioner uh, at that point uh, might necessarily like that, that decision and has a right of appeal to, um, in most cases, uh, the department. In pharmacy, it's slightly different. Um, with the new arrangements, it wouldn't be fair for the department to be, um, to use the phrase, judge, jury and executioner. So that's why we've had to, um, we are seeking to have those regulation powers to set up an independent bo body so they can make those second stage decisions. Um, in terms of commissioning, and you'll have to forgive me, I'm not an expert on commissioning. Um, I, I'm not sure there is an appeal mechanism for any decisions made in terms of commissioning at the moment in terms of the current structure. Um, so introducing a, an appeals mechanism for a new structure is, is probably something that we haven't given a lot of thought to. Mm -hmm. Okay, John, no, that's fair enough. And, and thanks for that answer. Um, and, and then just finally, um, how does the department intend to review the effectiveness of this legislation after it's brought in? Uh, well, the, like everything else, there will be a, a post-project evaluation internally within the department um, following um, all strands haven't been completed. Okay, John, thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, John, there's just one other thing I want to raise before uh, we let you go this morning. In relation to the children's services, and I know you had mentioned there that there's a requirement for an annual report within that. However, yeah. I would I would have a concern with this very particularly vulnerable or potentially vulnerable group and the organizational churn that might result as as just as a natural result of all these changes. And there could be a case of where there are things that people don't know that they don't know. Um, so I'm just wondering, is it possible in relation to that review that that would that that review process would be a early and and often throughout the initial pe period of this transition into the new system so that nothing uh, can fall through between the cracks there and that a child or children somewhere are left exposed or vulnerable to harm as a result of of this organizational change chair can i, can I just maybe um reiterate well i haven't said this before in terms of uh reports um, on the exercise of those social care and children functions. There is already a mechanism in place where a report goes to the board, at least annually, and then that is referred to the, the policy experts within the department. Yep. Um, every, you know, so really what we're doing is we're taking that middle level away. That report will go straightly will go straight to the department, and the department can, uh, as in terms of the 
way it's worded, the department can uh, ask for a review of the scheme at any stage. It doesn't have to be annually. They can ask for it, at, you know, at any stage during a year. Okay. Yeah. I'm depending on their, own, pro depending yeah, on their own professional view of, of, of the service being provided. Yeah, and I, th I think it would be appropriate that that would happen early in the cycle and ongoing, um, that, that, that that annual review could leave a lot of potential. And I, I, I do recognise, and I did hear you saying that the annual review is, is a, a minimum, but I think it would be important that given there's going to be a lot of organisational change and churn, that that, that, that is considered and, and kept a very close eye on. Okay. Can I say just though, in terms of the social care and children functions, if I reiterate my point from the opening statement, the same staff in terms of uh, discharging those functions in the board will be the same staff that are doing it in the department with the added value of the uh, policy colleagues now being closer at hand. Okay. Okay. And, and if that leads to improvement or streamlining, then I think that's, that's to be welcomed. Chair, if you don't mind, if I could just jump in there quickly. So, so yep. the, the loss of staff is one of the risks that we're closely managing. So uh, it was one of the reasons we went for the hosting option that staff retain their terms and conditions, uh, you, you know, so that there should be retention of staff that way. But also currently within the board, we're doing work on succession plan and knowledge transfer, uh, you know, to, 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 to plan for staff churn, as you say, that's out of our control. Okay. Okay, thank you, and uh, thank you, John. Is that? Uh, I think that's uh, that's everything as far as members are concerned. So I just want to thank yourself, John, uh, Gareth, and Alan, for your attendance here this morning and for addressing those with your briefing and also addressing members' questions to date. And I think, as as our leader there indicated, we will uh, we will be seeking to engage with you further in relation to the detail of this as we as we expand our understanding and perhaps uh, identify issues that, that, that may arise or that, that we could potentially add value to in terms of this bill. So thank you for that and good luck to you all in the time ahead. Appreciate you coming this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. okay, members, any comments there in relation to that? Um. So we will be obviously continuing with our scrutiny. There will be, be several other stages to all of this. So I think we can go back on, on some of those issues and maybe have a look at where we can add some value. Uh, Orlea, go ahead. Yes, sorry, Chair. See, just quickly, I don't know if it's worthwhile because it, it came up um, a couple of times just around that issue of the appeals for the commission and decisions when it does go to the department. Um, and I know that John was saying at the end there that he he's not an expert on the issue. He's not sure if there is a current appeals process in place at present. I don't know if it's worthwhile as a committee just trying to maybe find out a wee bit more around that detail so we can know for you know for any further discussions that we're going to have around the bill and if we do want to make amendments um, yep. just to find out if that process is in place currently. Yeah, Clark, can I just check with you? Uh, can we can we get further information on that? And, and at, what, at what point do we start to look at potential amendments or uh, to the bill? It's certainly, Chair, in relation to the, the, the issue that Orly has raised, certainly we can um, get some clarification. I think we also might ask for um, details of the process for commissioning services so we can get it seen clearly what the current process is, what the process will look like after um, the change. In relation to the bill itself, yes, you're correct, we'll have a couple of other with a session with the, the board in two weeks um, to get their views on it. Um, but also in relation to amendments, the, it's still out for consultation at the minute, the committee's consultation, so we'll wait and see what responses we get in as well. Um, then we'll tease those issues out um, during oral evidence, and then after consideration of oral evidence, we can then look at what possible amendments the committee would wish to, to, to take forward on the bill. Okay. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Okay, members. So I'm going to maybe then. I'm just to check with you, Clark. Do we have a do Do we have officials on the line for the SRs before I move into the SL one? We we do indeed, Charlie and Debbie are are there. 
Okay, so we'll just carry on then, members, uh, for now going through the, the SL1s and, SL, and SRs. Item 7 there is SL1, Public Health Notifiable Diseases Order, NA2020, Inclusion of Hepatitis C. I refer you, members, to tab 7 of the pack and in particular to the clerk's memo at tab 7.1. The Department of Health is proposing to make a statutory rule to make hepatitis C a notifiable disease so that medical practitioners will be required to share patient information with the public health agency if they become aware or have reasonable grounds for suspecting that a person they are attending has hepatitis C. The department advises that it held a targeted consultation on the matter and received a favourable response. The department further advises that the SR will be subject to negative resolution. So do members have any issues they wish to raise in relation to that? Sure. Go ahead, Carol, and then I see Pam's hand raised. So, Carol. Um, so, so, Chair, but I, I would just want, I have no issue with uh, the, the SR, but, but, but I don't know what targeted consultation means. Um, so, I think even just for future reference, it would be good to get a definition of that. Yeah. Yeah, and I, yeah, actually, I, I also would like to actually to to be advised as to who the who the targeted consultation was with, because that that did strike me as a bit uh, unclear as well. Um, uh, Pam, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. No, uh, do we have official staff to question too? No, we don't have officials, but we do have time if um, in future weeks we want the. Um, or we can relay questions back to them um, okay. and get responses on it. Yeah, maybe that would be good, Chair, um, if we could even uh, just ask about um, why there's been this substantive delay in, in making the change to the notifiable diseases, given that the rest of the UK and the Irish Republic have added hepatitis C to their regimes during the period 2004-2010. Okay, so members, I think then uh, the, the best way to approach would be to defer our consideration of this and put it back on the agenda at a future meeting with official in place to take some questions. Is that, uh, is that everything okay with that, Clerk? Yep, yep, certainly, Chair. We can um, get in touch with the Department and arrange a, a briefing on it, not a problem. Okay, and members content with that, line, that approach? Yeah. Or Chair if you wanted to just submit any questions in, in writing, if that's easier, I don't mind. Um, well, it, it, it may be easier. It, it, well, let's, let's, if, if members are content, let's submit the questions in writing and we can then consider whether or not a briefing is required. Maybe they can address it because I'm conscious that we do have a lot in our forward work programme. So there's two issues there, Clerk, uh, around the issue of the, cons the targeted consultation and the delay. So let's let's start out then, if members are content, by getting a written briefing, a written update on those. And then we'll come back to the SL1 then at that stage. Okay. Thank you, members. So um, moving on then, members, the next four agenda items are statutory rules on COVID travel restrictions. I refer members to the papers at tabs 8 to 11 of the pack, and in particular to the clerk's memo at tab 8.1. We also have a response from the department to previous issues the committee raised at a previous briefing on travel regs at tab 12 points of your table. Departmental officials are here to brief the committee today on the provisions of each of these SRs. So I would now like, like to welcome back to committee uh, Ms. Elaine Colgan, who is Chief of Staff to the Chief Medical Officer. Good afternoon, Elaine. Are you able to hear us okay? Uh, yes. Good afternoon, Chair and members. Yep, you're very welcome, Elaine. And also, Miss Deborah Sharp, uh, who is International Travel Lead with the Department of Health. Uh, are you able to hear us okay, Deborah? I am, Chair. Can you hear me okay? Yep, hearing you fine. So, hearing you both fine, thank you very much for coming along to the committee. And I'll go back to you, Elaine, just to uh, if you want to go ahead with your briefing just on these. Okay, issues. Chair. I'll, Thanks, I'll, Chair. I'll do the briefing and then whatever questions committee members have between Elaine and myself, we will try and address those. Um, so good afternoon, Chair and members, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee on amendments that have been made to the parent international travel regulations since our last update on the 11th of March. So since that time, there have been four amendments made. 
first one, ASR 2021 number 54, which is amendment number eight. So this amending regulation amended schedule two to the principal international travel regulations, which sets out the exemptions to the travel requirements by extending the definition of air crew to allow additional personnel that would be essential um, to aircraft maintenance to be included within that definition and avail of these certain exemptions in the course of their work. As a result of that definition change, um, it resulted in the crew exemption that was contained in Schedule 2A of the parent regulations um, that therefore became redundant and was no longer needed. So therefore a technical amendment as you will. And finally, amendment number eight um, updated the list of Northern Ireland sporting competitions in Schedule 4. And these included the FIFA World Cup qualifier fixtures, UEFA designated home friendly fixtures and UEFA European Championship playoffs. So the second amended regulation that I'll discuss is 2021 number 69, which is amendment number nine. So these amending regulations added Qatar, Ethiopia, Oman and Somalia to Schedule 5 of the principal regulations, which is a schedule that highlights red list countries. Those are countries that are subject to additional measures. Currently, as of today, what that means is anyone returning to Northern Ireland from those countries would be subject to self-isolation for 10 days, along with members of their household. However, as we have no direct international flights at the present, any Northern Ireland arrivals would have to come either via GB or ROI, and they would be subject to um, travel restrictions in those jurisdictions, which include managed quarantine in hotels. Um, the regulate that amendment number nine regulation also removed Portugal and Mauritius from that red list. And as a result, they were also those countries were also removed from Schedule Six, which lists countries where there's a prohibition on aircraft and vessels arriving. And similarly, Schedule Six was amended to include flight bans for Ethiopia, Amman, and Qatar. Uh, in addition, Amendment Number Nine um, amended the travel history period from 14 days to 10 days where passengers have to provide this information on their PLF for red list country arrivals. This is in line with international travel provisions elsewhere in the UK and was informed by scientific evidence of the risk of transmission being greatest in the initial 10 day period after exposure to the virus. And finally, amendment number nine corrected a minor drafting error in previous um, regulations. So the third one today is amendment number 10, SR 2021 number 84. These regulations introduced, reintroduced an exemption from the requirement to self-isolate uh, for essential persons engaged in film production and high-end TV production. The requirement to self-isolate will still actually apply when the individual is not carrying out the relevant work activity um, for which the exemption applies to. Um, the, the exemption in question does require a level of control which actually falls to the Department for the Economy and NI Screen and will include nomination by NI Screen and approval by the Department for the Economy, all which evidence has to be provided for on the applicant's um, application form. There has to be a commitment for NI Screen to invest one million in the project in question, and NI Screen will have to confirm that the presence of the person in Northern Ireland is essential to the production. And finally, the fourth amendment regulation, number 11, which is SR 2021-95. So these regulations added Bangladesh, Kenya, Pakistan and the Philippines to the red list country schedule, which is Schedule 5. Happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Debbie. And I suppose, first of all, um, I suppose I'm curious in, in relation to 
as this all develops and it, it's very dynamic, I have to say, and very, you know, there's a lot of changes. It's hard to keep up with. Um, but is there any discussions within the department at this point in time to returning to a more normalized system whereby these processes will be coming via SL1 in the first instance through the committee and then going, going into SRs? Um, and I suppose just to illustrate the, uh, you know, part of my reasoning on that, I came, uh, I, w I was dealing with a very difficult case over Easter in relation to someone who had traveled into Heathrow Airport. They were traveling with a very sick, uh, a very unwell individual. He actually finished up being admitted to hospital immediately on arrival home. They were delayed from flying on, on, the, on the day that they were supposed to fly out of Heathrow to return home here. And it turned out that it was impossible for them to access the tests that were required of them in the legislation. Now, I received significant assistance on that from a communications officer within Heathrow Airport and also from the PHA here, in fairness to them, to address the issue and get it resolved. However, there was clearly a systemic issue there that hadn't been picked up on. The system had been taken across or cut and pasted across from what had been rolled out in England, but didn't take into account the, the needs or the ability, nor didn't facilitate those people and those travellers from being able to access the test that they required to have. Therefore, they couldn't produce the evidence that they were required to produce. So to me, it would add value if these issues were being considered more fully via the committee and via representatives, a real life experience of difficulties that are arising. And to further illustrate that, I'm also dealing with a case that I know that, that people are planning to travel in the near future um, with two children who... Uh, will be will, are, are uh, have additional needs that are very specific and in light of the mandatory quarantine that's being developed by the department it would to me be very important that we would see some contingencies being put in place to deal with real medical physical and mental health needs uh, in terms of how we're going to manage those travelers with quarantine and i think the process of engaging more normally with the committee in relation to all of that would be beneficial to the department and also to the outcome of the of the uh, of the regulations. So, can you indicate for us what your planning is around around moving this back to a more normal um, legislative and and process? Um, Debbie, do you want me to take that one? Um, so, yes. Yeah, so, uh, I'll, I'll just try to, to take those points in turn and come back to the the process part at the end, if that's okay, um, Chair. Yeah. Uh, I know there was a, an issue over Easter for travellers coming through England who, was le who were legally required under English legislation to comply with mandatory testing processes and that arose because of the introduction of private testing providers in England who did not um, allow booking of those tests for Northern Ireland addresses. Um, we have since worked with Department of Health and Social Care to identify which private providers will Delivered to Northern Ireland, and they have done. They have engaged with private providers to provide that clarity. Um, th it was possible to comply, but it was very difficult to find out how, um, because you could only use the public NHS trace system to book a test, and that wasn't clear on the English websites. Um, that was a requirement under the English regulations, rather than the Northern Ireland regulations, which made it more difficult for us to be able to provide clarity to people here. So I do accept there was an issue, and I hope. That you provide that we have provided some comfort and that we have thought to address it as quickly as we were able to with DHSC as soon as we became aware of it. Um, in, the, in terms of the managed isolation case that you that you referred to, um, so we do the, the the executive office has been leading on the policy for managed isolation, um, but we, there will be a, a sort of a, a process by where, whereby people will be able to engage in specific circumstances to find out if they're able to be exempt from that process. Um, and we, whenever um, that comes in, which will be within the next couple of days, we, we will um, we will hope to we, what we hope to do is write to the committee and outline the the differences in the requirements here. Um, Sorry, I should I should maybe roll back a bit. Whenever we introduce managed isolation, we will be doing a consolidation of the travel regulations at the same time, which will hopefully be later today. Um, our fingers crossed. Uh, and what we will what we plan to do is write to committee to outline the differences between those regulations and the current regulations that we have in place to, to provide an aid um, to interpreting the new format. Um, and 
the the managed isolation, as I said, was led by the executive office on the policy, but they, my understanding is that they will avail of the same contract procedures that's in place in England so that a person with particular medical needs will be able to seek advice uh, in the same way they would as the current process is already in place and, and functioning well in England. Okay, and in relation to, in relation to more general return to uh, the SL1 process, what's the, uh, yeah, what's so the planning for that? Yeah, and, and I, I very much would, would agree with you, Chair. I do think that it would be beneficial for us to, to be able to avail of the, the committee scrutiny in advance of making the regulations. I think that uh, there, there is example, you've, you've given two cases today where it would obviously have been helpful to be able to have some foresight and see that the, and foresee that those things could have come up and pre prevent the, the the individuals concerned having to go through what they had to go through, um, it, it's simply just very difficult at the moment. And whilst I will commit to committee to keep to, to moving to normal process as soon as we possibly can, at the moment the the pace of change is just makes it impossible. And, and and just to give the example from this week with with the managed isolation regulations, we were working right through to the last night on the what the, what the the policy and exemptions needed to be for the regulations. And in order to to submit an SL one, we would need to have a certain level of clarity in advance of writing that and sending it to committee in order for it to be of use. Um, and so we just don't have that in it with sufficient days. In advance, you know, even if we had that at the start of the week, for example, we could have written an SL1 to committee and and included that today in today's briefing, uh, but we just didn't have the clarity soon enough. Uh, and that's nobody's fault. It's just the pace that things are working to. Uh, everyone is working really hard, and and the the teams in the executive office and our team are really really good uh, teams working hard. And all I can say at this point is that we're sorry that we can't engage in the normal process and that we do do want to do that as soon as we can. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Uh, thanks. I'm going to go then to members. So I'm going first of all to Alan Chambers, then I have Jerry Carroll and then Cara Hunter. So go ahead, Alan, please. Thanks, Chair. I'm going to uh, ask your indulgence here uh, uh, and also the indulgence of Elaine, maybe to, to raise a query. It's not quite related to what we're dealing with, but just yesterday I was uh, approached by someone and it's relation to um, three inspectors who are going to be coming to Northern Ireland for about five days. They're associated with cattle breeders associations and their job is to verify the pedigree um, status of pedigree cattle uh, and they want to know uh, do they require a quarantine or is there some exemption in the regulations that they they can come for uh, uh, five days uh, and complete their, their work around the farms in Northern Ireland. Um. So, I, I I'm not entirely sure that there is Deborah. Maybe you could clarify on this one. But my understanding is that there probably isn't for cattle for agriculture at the moment. Um. That said, that uh, DERA would be the lead department on this issue. So, if there was a need for an exemption, then that could be proposed, and we could look at that. But Deborah, do you want to clarify? I don't think there's one in place at the moment. No, um, Alan, I don't believe from what you've explained there, and I obviously maybe more detail would would, would be helpful. But um, from what you've suggested, no, as it currently stands, there isn't one where an exemption would fall in for that category. Um, Unfortunately, no. Well, that's what I thought. I was asking the question for. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, and I suppose, I suppose, Alan, in terms of, I was prepared to indulge because I think that does indicate, you know, the need and the benefit of having a bespoke system whereby we can interact. You know, I am aware that we have at different times passed some quite strange exemptions. Um, I think the Welsh <laughs> cricket team was one of them that springs to mind. I'm not sure if the Welsh cricket team are battering down our doors to get onto our Saint of Ireland. <laughs> But um, it, it highlights the difficulty and the problems whenever whenever we're simply kind of cutting and pasting, where we could probably now, with some bit more time, start to uh, refine the system to our own needs uh, more more accurately yeah. aligned. Okay, yeah. um, okay, thanks, Alan. I'm going then to Jerry Carroll. Jerry, thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, panel. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I've seen um, India. There's been a um, further. 
um, a new wave, uh, 200,000 cases yesterday and 1,000 deaths. Uh, but my understanding is they're not on the red list uh, for the UK. Um, and that's obviously quite concerning given the you know the other countries like Bangladesh and, and others are. Um, so can I get an update on that in terms of what discussions have been had um, in relation to India in particular, uh, given the scale of um, cases? And uh, I'm not sure if it's a new variant or not, but there's certainly a worry in rise in cases there and, and, and how that could impact uh, on here. So that'll be helpful. Thanks. Um, so there was a review of the, the red list this week across the UK and there has it was determined there was no changes needed at this point. Um, the red list is specifically, as, as, as members will be aware, focused on variants of concern rather than case transmission. So the, the, that, that, that's the main focus um, to prevent importation of variants. And so at this point, as far as I'm aware, there isn't any variants of concern issues um, that we need that justify India going onto the red list. Uh, and it will, the red list is reviewed every two weeks, so it will be kept under constant review. Um, and what the, the, those travellers that do come from India will still have to self-isolate uh, when they come here, but they wouldn't have to go into managed isolation. All right, excellent. And just a quick follow-up, Chair. Um, and and it, would that change, uh, that review? Um, so uh, if cases still continue to rise, um, the India will still not remain on the red list. It's only if, it's, if there's a new vari variant of the virus, or, or how, how would that change uh, potentially uh, if things kind of continue to, to increase? Yeah. So the Joint Biosecurity Centre do take into account a number of factors. Um, even even if the variant didn't necessarily come from India, if it has a presence of other variants of concern that have been imported into India, and then there's potential for that to be exported again, that would be uh, something that might trigger uh, that going onto the red list. Uh, so there's the, and the, um, the cases I, I will, will be part of it. Um, so they will do that assessment again back at the end of next week, the start of the week after. Um, but they do keep it under review. So whilst that's the schedule uh, review, if there was something that triggered uh, as an urgent situation the need for change, and um, then we we would be alerted to that as well. And just finally, so I, uh, and you, Elaine, or somebody in the department. Uh, has an input into that conversation in terms of um, the red list and, and what countries are, are kind of on that uh, and how will we impact it better? Yes, so once we get the, the technical data assessment from the JBC, the decisions on the red list for Northern Ireland are made in Northern Ireland by the, the Chief Medical Officer, the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Minister. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. And um, going then to Cara Hunter. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to the panel, both uh, Debbie and Elaine, for being here today. Uh, my question uh, refers to mandatory testing. Um, this is an issue that's been brought forward by a number of constituents to me. I'm just going to read a snippet here from NI Direct. Uh, during the week starting the 12th of April, passengers travelling to NI from a non-red list country will be required to book and pay for a day two and a day eight test kit. Um, and then it says, as soon as the date of introduction is determined, this page will be updated and will include information about how to book tests uh, and manage isolation packages. But there's no further information. So I'm just looking, uh, do you have any updates or any developments uh, on mandatory testing? That'd be very helpful. Thank you. Um, yeah, that, that website is, should actually be updated as we speak. Um, so the dates will legally they'll come in tomorrow, um, but because we have no direct flights planned, on, we don't expect any direct international flights until next week operationally on the ground. That, that doesn't actually bring in a change to what anyone's requirements are um, because they're, they're already in place in England and if they've transferred through, they will have to comply to, trans, to transit. Um, okay. So we, we will have that updated by the end of today. And are you aware, uh, just around the costs of these tests, or is there a range of costs, or how does it work? Um, for when, once it comes in in Northern Ireland, initially we will only use the test and the NHS tests at a cost, which I will need to verify. But at one point it was in and around two hundred pounds, and give or take. So that's roughly the ballpark figure. Uh, we will we will be working on a process to bring on private providers, um, which England have recently just introduced in the last few weeks. It's just a phased approach in the same way that England did it um, whenever they first introduced it in February um, to give us time to get things like data flow sorted from private providers and things. So we will be bringing them online, but at the moment it's only going to be the NHS option. Uh, and can I ask, uh, just off the back of that, uh, across um, the UK, uh, like in England, Scotland and Wales, is the cost similar to that of Northern Ireland or is it is it less than? Do you know? 
for the NHS test, the cost will be the same regardless of which jurisdiction you're booking that for. Um, the private providers, some of them will be cheaper and some of them will be more expensive than the NHS tests. So um, we imagine that once the private market starts to take over and international travel uh, increases again, that there will be more competition and more pressure to reduce costs. Okay, that's great. 200 is a significant price, but no, that's great. Thank you, Elaine. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. And Paula Bradshaw then. Uh, Paula, is the final indication I have on this section at the minute? So go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, panel, for the information so far. I, I wasn't going to raise this, but just off the back of what Cara had asked there, and it's about the quarantine in hotels. And obviously, we don't have any direct flights at the minute, but that could change within the next few weeks, even next month or so. So I'm just wondering what preparation uh, is underway and whether any specific hotels have actually been commissioned for when that eventuality takes place. Thank you. Um, yes, so that will come in tomorrow as well, and the Executive Office has been the one leading the, the introduction of that in terms of the operational terms, so they have been the ones liaising with hotels and getting those in place, and I, I understand there is one, there only really needs to be one at the moment. Um, we, we expect international flights to start again next week with Amsterdam, uh, flights arriving again, and uh, while that's not obviously a red country, there is potential that people will have used Skipold as a transit hub. So Border Force um, are well up to speed as to what's needed for passengers coming off that to make sure that none of them have been in red countries in the previous 10 days, even though they've come directly from the Netherlands and they're working with us on that as well. Um, so the, we, we will obviously be able to provide more briefing to, to the committee um, and we will, as I say, write the committee to outline the new regulations, even though it's not really a self one process, it's a bit afterwards, but we, we, will, we will still do that because I think it would be helpful. Um, and uh, the executive office can provide us some input on the, the, the operational side of things that they've been working on as well. Thank you. But just to confirm, you're saying that one hotel has actually been appointed or are they still in negotiations? To... Yeah, yeah. No, no, it, it has. As far as I understand, it has been appointed. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And thank you, Elaine and Deborah, for your attendance and um, uh, for your commitment there to to looking at that issue and to seeing how we can start to now refine and do things better and more more aligned with with where we're at and what we need. So thank you for attendance here this afternoon and no doubt we'll be speaking to you again soon in due course. But take care and good luck for now. All the best. Thank you, Chair. Bye. Okay, members. So um, I'm going to then go through the rules uh, one by one as as we normally do. And reverting then to the first one, which was SR twenty twenty one forward slash the health protection coronavirus international travel amendment number eight regs NA twenty twenty one. So can I remind members that the additional plenary sessions over the Easter recess brought forward the end of the statutory period for this SR. Members were informed of this change by email and were asked to email the clerk if they had any issues to raise. Um, the examiner of statutory rules reports that the rule was made in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the reason for the breach and has no other issues to raise. So have members any other further issues they wish to raise? Uh, no? Okay. Well, then, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 54, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 8 Regulations, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Moving on then to item 9, which is SR 2021 forward slash 69. So this SR amends the travel history period for countries deemed to be high risk and subject to additional measures. It also makes amendments to the list of countries subject to additional measures. The examiner of statutory rules reports that the rule was made in breach of the 21-day rule, but that she is content with the reason for this breach and has no other issues to raise. Have members any further issues to wish to raise in connection with the rule? No, thank you. Can I then ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 69, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 9 Regulations, 2021 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. Thank you, members. Uh, item 10 is SR 2021 forward slash 4. 
So remind members that this ASR introduces an exemption from the requirement to self-isolate for persons engaged in film and high-end TV production when carrying out their relevant work or activity. The examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported on this ASR. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? And just before I do that, I just want to check, Clerk, uh, there, was one, there was one ASR that there had come something back from the examiner. Is this the one in question? No, Chair. The, the other two that you mentioned previously were the 21-day um, issues. So there were. So the examiner hasn't reported on, um, on this one yet. Okay. Uh, and the next one as well, sorry. Okay, thank you. So that is that is confirmed then that the examiner of statutory rules has not yet reported in the SR. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? No. So in light of that, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 84, Health Protection, Coronavirus, International Travel, Amendment Number 10, Regulations, 2021, and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, agreed. Thank you, members. And the final SR then for consideration today is SR 2021 forward slash 95. This SR makes further amendments to the list of countries subject to additional measures. The examiner of statutory rules has not reported yet on this SR. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with this statutory rule? No, thank you, members. If not, then can I ask you members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2021 forward slash 95, the Health Protection Coronavirus International Travel Amendment Number 11 Regulations 2021, and subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Yep, members are agreed. Okay, thank you, members. Members, I propose we take a, a short comfort break there just before we move on to correspondence and our forward work program. Um, the fair amount of work to be covered in that. So if I could ask members to just take a very brief break there, approximately eight minutes, and return back here to resume at, 30, at 10 past one. Thank you, members. And can I ask the clerk to take us out of broadcasting? Broadcasting, if you could go... Um... The Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. 
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program sound.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber Programme Sound. Thank you, Clerk. Okay, members, thank you for returning. And we're going to pick up again on uh, item agenda item 12, which is correspondence. So can I draw your attention there, members, to some items? Um, item 12.4 is a departmental response to issues raised by the committee in relation to SR 2021 forward slash 8. And that's the one that provided for temporary changes to the mental health order and the disparity in the use of that order between various different trusts. So, have members any comments to make in relation to that? Yes, or Leah? Um, yeah, Chair, so grateful for um, the response, but I just I think that just a note that it is obviously worrying that some of the trusted have to use, um, they had to use that provision uh, more so than other trusts due to, as the Minister said in his letter, due to staffing pressures and because they have a small pool of staff, I think when we were briefed, at the time, the official said that there were only four or five of those doctors that can provide that service. But at the same time, there was obviously a number of people um, that was affected by that, um, where it exceeded the three months where they got their second opinion for their medication. So I note that in the response, he was saying that the, the officials are going to work with RQIA to increase um, the, the number of those staff. And I just think it's something that the committee, I think, will need to just stay on top of that and maybe get a further update to see how they get on with RQIA. Um, because it's important that um, that they expand that pool um, of staff. I also think it's it's worrying and disappointing that you know there's an admission there that the pressures have increased on mental health inpatient units. Um, but obviously the minister said that he can't increase the number of mental health inpatient beds. And again, one of the reasons for that was because of a limited amount of the specialised staff of that service. So I know we maybe talk about it later on in our Fort Work programme, but I mean, it's just, it's bringing to the fore the issues and the pressures on the system in relation to mental health. So it's just to note those concerns. Yeah, thank you, uh, Leah. Yeah, and I think I think it is a, a bit of a concern that, that uh, core staffing issues then would be, you know, that there would be no attempt or no uh, move towards extending COVID measures to deal with what are actually staffing issues rather than COVID issues. So uh, are members content to be right to the department in relation to that? Yeah, members are content. Thank you. Um, moving on to item 12.6 is a departmental response to issues raised by the committee following the briefing on waiting times. Um, and I suppose we have already indicated that we we're, we want more detail from the department in relation to the waiting times. So our members, we, we've agreed that already. Our members, any other comments from members at this point? No. Okay. Thank you. So members content to note and and uh, content. Yeah. Okay. So item 12 point uh, to, to note, but also to reply and ask for that additional information. Item 12.19 is a response from the Attorney General's Office regarding legal advice provided to the Executive in relation to the commissioning of abortion services. Have members any comments in relation to that? Our members, go ahead, Jerry, and then I have Paula. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I just thought the reply was 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 quite weak, and the fact that we're not being told whether advice was given to the, the Minister or, or the Executive, uh, I think showed a certain level of contempt for the committee. So I'm, I'm disappointed um, by the by the reply, um, and I'm sure others are uh, as well. Paula? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I suppose that that's the protocol I've written to him before, or the, the um, Attorney General before, and they was advised that they don't even have to tell us where that it was, was expecting that. But what, um, what is useful and the clarity that was provided is, is that it says, it is for the minister to decide whether there is a risk that the commissioning of services would be considered significant or controversial. And I suppose that was the clarity that I was looking for in that he wasn't obliged to bring it forward. It was the minister himself who, who was to decide and make that determination about whether it was controversial or not. The Health and Social Care Bill um, guidance, I'm just going to repeat myself here, makes it very clear that for health services where it's not cross-cutting, it is up to his department alone to move forward with commissioning of services. So I'm glad to have that on black and white today. 
Okay, thank you. And are members content to note? Yep, thank you. Item 12.20 is from a business owner who provides hairdressing and wig services to those suffering hair loss through cancer and other conditions. And this, uh, this, this business owner is concerned that the business has been classified as non-essential retail and not eligible, therefore, for grants. Have members any comments they wish to make in relation to that item? Yes, Chair. Go ahead, Pam. Yeah, thanks, Chair, for that. Um, yeah, I'd sent this through the committee because whilst it's not in my constituency, I just thought it was uh, uh, very bizarre, actually, that, that this um, company has been treated the way they have. Uh, and there seems to be there seems to be uh, an inconsistency in other services which have been allowed to continue to to carry on, and it just strikes me that you know at such a incredibly stressful period in in some cancer patients' lives that to be denied this service is actually quite cruel, and uh, to me it, it's more of a mental health service actually. Um, so um, it seems strange that either they wouldn't be allowed to open or that they, they weren't able to avail of, of the, the finances to protect them. So then um, uh, we are sending it on to the department for a full um, explanation. And I think probably we need to um, also maybe raise it with, um, um, I think we need to raise it with Department of Finance and possibly even LPS to get a better understanding of why these businesses have been reclassified particularly at the, at the stage in the pandemic that that happened as well. So I think there are kind of some, some answers needed on, on behalf of this um, business in particular. And when you said, when you said there are the department, um, Pam, is that in relation to, I know, I know the Department for the Economy uh, have quite a bit of uh, input into these schemes as well. So is that the department, so you're, are you suggesting the Department of Economy and the Department of Finance both I think, it's, uh, I think it's finance and and land and property services. I think, um, but whichever departments would be appropriate, I don't I don't mind it where it goes to as long as we get uh, the answers for that business itself. I, I just think it's you know it's there needs to be recognition of the benefits that these businesses do provide to patients who are suffering from cancer and other illnesses, um, especially through a pandemic. Which I think is really important that. That, um, that those type of supports are protected and, and that they're there for people, even in, especially in lockdown, quite frankly. So uh, whichever departments it needs to go to, but I think it's probably Department of Finance and, and LPS. Okay, and um, Clerk, would, would it be the case that if we forward to the Department of Finance, they will raise with LPS, and also uh, if there is a Department of Economy uh, element to that, should, can we and should we write to both? We, we can certainly we, we can certainly uh, highlight to the finance um, department that we would seek the views of LPS as well um, on this. So we, yeah, I think that, um, we could write to both economy, finance, and um, to the LPS within that. Okay, sure. members. Yeah, sure. Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think TEO need to be involved in this as well. Um, because they're they're they're, they're the people who are getting guidelines for the rest, but the LPS I think is the separate one that needs to be picked up. So I will just look to you who can answer well. Yeah, uh, members content with that addition? Yeah. Okay. Okay, again, again, I think it speaks to that need and, and the benefit of engaging with committees around some of these things to kind of try to foresee or forestall some of these issues from rising, uh, which, which would be possible better through the, the whole SL1 process. So uh, I think that speaks to that. Okay, members, thank you for that. Item 12.22 is the February monitoring report for the children's social care coronavirus temporary modification of children's social care regulations. Um, and item 12.27, so linking these two, is from the department informing the committee of the department's consultation on the extension of the temporary children's social care regs to the 7th of November. Members will remember that the committee considered the previous extension to the these arrangements on the 19th of November and wrote to the department expressing the committee's concern around the use of these provisions. So, uh, are members, any uh, comments in relation to this? Yeah. Carol, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, I, I would like to get some comments from the Children's Law Centre on this because you remember the report 
support they brought in to us before uh, with some concerns in this. And given the issues that our Leah has already raised and your others have raised, I would like to see something along the lines of this. It looks like an extension just in case, but when you're talking about potential breaches of rights, uh, I, I'm not comfortable with it. Yeah, any other any other thoughts, members? Okay, and um, so and I have to say, I, I, I would share the concern in relation to that, not only in terms of a potential impact on rights, which is crucial, but also potential uh, risks and vulnerability and potential uh, harm that, that could flow as a result of that. And I do see from the from the uh, from the report that they forwarded that they're being used in quite small numbers. So um, there's a proposal there, members, that we, we take some additional evidence there and possibly that might involve having to schedule in an informal session given our forward work programme. Would members be content with uh, with with that proposal? Yeah. Okay, I just want to check Pam your yeah, Pam, no, you just, your hand still raised say, there, Pam. Are you looking in on this? Uh, yes, I didn't realise it was, but yes, I was looking in this. It was just to say that perhaps, given the workload, maybe we should be asking for even a uh, maybe some written briefs from whoever on as, as many of these things as we can, just in order to try and ease the burden going forward. Yeah. And the extension arrangements, the extension arrangement will come back to the committee as a statutory rule, um, I suppose, at some point. So, and, and we should, I, th I think we could usefully write to the department and request a written briefing on the outcome of the consultation and the changes the department has made following the consultation. Uh, so, members content that we write to that effect? Yeah, also. Thank you. Okay, members, moving on then to item 12.30, which is from the Stroke Association, requesting an informal discussion with the Committee on Stroke Services. Uh, any, mem any members, any comments to make in relation to that issue? No, I, I would support that, Chair. I think it'll be very timely as we move towards the rebuild of the health service. Okay, thank you. Are members content to note on that we will look at that uh, in relation to some of our forward work uh, in, uh, in relation to some of those sessions that we're... Planning? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you. Item 12.31 is from the Pharmaceutical Society of NI, also seeking to meet with the committee to discuss the implications of the recent white paper for a health and care bill in Westminster. Uh, if members are content, I would propose they'll meet informally with the Pharmaceutical Society in the first instance, and all, mem all and every any members are, are, are quite welcome to attend that informal meeting. But just to get a sort of a, an understanding of what the issues are, I, I propose that maybe I do that if members are content. Chad, happy to join you if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, members are content with that. So, have members any comments or proposals on any other items of correspondence? I see Paula and uh, yeah, I see Paula indicating and I think Carol. Go ahead, Paula. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the member is in relation to 12.1 Paula, sorry, sorry, Paula. Can I can I interrupt you, Paula? We're actually not really picking up your sound very well there. Um, is there anything you can do to improve your sound quality? We weren't able to follow you. Sure, and um, if anybody's not speaking, you should be able Yeah, can there is some feedback coming through? So can members all just check that you're all on mute there at the present time before I go back to Paula? Uh, try th yep, try that now, Paula. Thank you, Chair. The sound quality hasn't been great all morning, I have to say. But the, the, it was in relation to 12.15. It was the Justice Committee um, wrote to us about the damages bill. Um, obviously, there's quite a read across in terms of health, in terms of uh, medical negligence, and the premiums in terms of insurance for the likes of GP. So I'm just wondering, is this something that we really do need to dig a wee bit further down into. Um, maybe that's for the clerk in terms of our response because of the implications for the people that we represent. Yeah. Clerk, can you give us some... Uh, are, are you proposing that we write and ask for further information, Paula? No. I, as I say, for example, I was contacted by a GP who's very concerned about the premium, the insurance premium for her practice now um, going forward um, in relation to what's been proposed in the bill. So it's really just to try and get an understanding of how this bill will impact uh, on the um, primary care sector, for example, and independent um, health care providers. 
before we make a response to the Department for Justice? The Justice okay. Committee, Yeah. Clerk, can you yeah. advise on that? Sure. Um, the, the suggestion, suggested action is that we write to the department seeking a, a copy of their submission. Um, and once we got that, that would allow us to form, I suppose, an opinion on what the department's saying um, that's relevant, whether that then leads us to seeking further information from others. Um, I am due to have a discussion with the clerk of the Justice Committee to highlight that the, this is an area that um, we may be looking to supply a, a submission on, but we wouldn't be in a position to do until we get a response from the department on that. Okay, no, I'm, I'm happy with that, Keith, but if you can just bear in mind when you're speaking to the, the other clerk that this is an issue that's been raised with me from a GP. So um, so that's the first one. And then the second one is in relation to 12.26, and that's the correspondence from SHIELD, um, Shield Us. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of correspondence during the pandemic from those people who've um, had to shield um, the pandemic in many ways with the vaccine looks like you know things are very much improving for wider society but there's still those clinically extremely vulnerable people who um, are being impacted on a daily basis so I'm just wondering again uh, conscious of time but is there any way that we can maybe have an informal briefing session from them in terms of where they're at in terms of how life is for them at this point in time and their key asks of government um, as they sort of move through and out of the pandemic. Okay, well, I'm conscious that we are moving into closed session for forward work program, and uh, I'm also conscious of broadcasting will drop at one thirty. So, if we can maybe bring that up again in bro in in uh, forward work, Paula. Yes, thanks, fine, thanks. Yep. Thank you. Okay, uh, or Leah. Um, yeah, it was just on item twelve point two. Um, it was the, the minister's response to the public petition that was brought to the floor of the assembly calling for additional um, detox provisions in, in Derry um, and around the, the Centre of Excellence, the Addictions Centre in Derry. Um, and again, I just think that um, the response was a bit disappointing. I think that the minister, and he's correct in what he's saying, um, that, you know, through new, de new decade, new approach, um, that there isn't all the available funding to deliver on all those priorities. But it was basically just brought it back to um, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And I mean, I think that right across the executive people do need to get behind, um, you know, supporting the mental health and the serious addiction issues that our societies face with. But I think that it was an opportunity, you know, even for the Minister to, to give some form of commitment from himself as the Minister of Health um, to, to support those calls for, for Derry. Um, so I just want to put that that on record, and hopefully again it's something we can factor into the Fort Work program. Okay, thank you, Arlea. Um, okay, so uh, are members otherwise content with the actions proposed on the correspondence memo? Yeah, thank you, members. In terms of table correspondence, then it uh, contains a number of further items of correspondence. I would just like to draw members' attention to one of those items, which is twelve point three five which is a letter from the Minister advising that the Department of Health has a vastly reduced role in policy and policy intent in the pathway to recovery. The letter advises that the Executive Office are lead in relation to policy. The letter outlines that the Minister and Department of Health will still need to make the regulations, and this committee will still need to scrutinise the regulations. So, um, any comment in relation to that, members? Sure. Carol, yeah, go ahead, Carol. The health minister is responsible for health policy. I, I don't understand that, to be honest with you. I think it's just batting the stuff back to TO, which isn't right. Yeah, my concern, my concern would be that that it becomes more difficult to apply the limited scrutiny that we're able to apply at the minute. Um, obviously, we are we are not the committee for the TEO. The policy and and the legislation is coming through health. Uh, so. Um, what 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 uh, what do members feel on that in relation to should we write back and express our concerns in relation to the quality and of scrutiny and and to ask for further explanation? I don't think it particularly deals with the issues very well. Would members be content with that approach? Yeah. Okay, members. Okay, I will maybe just with members indulgence and if you're content, take any other business because I'm very conscious we're going to go into closed session for for the forward work program. So if I can just deal with AOB in before we lose broadcasting. I have one indication there from Carol. Go ahead, Carol. 
Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, it's really in relation to the Dr. Watt scandal. Um, I mean, I've been dealing with a lot of people who have been impacted by this. And with with uh, like I've received like many others, I'm sure you know, growing concerns regarding the latest um, revelation that the current consultant is now under GMV or GMC uh, investigation. But notwithstanding that, I think we need to see what reports were commissioned by the Belfast Trust as a result of this. Now, maybe the committee's already seen this. I'm not aware of any. I've looked. Uh, even if it's in closed session, I think this issue uh, needs to be dealt with and dealt with promptly. Okay. Are members, are members consent, content that we would seek those reports? Yeah. Members content. Thank you. Okay. So we'll, we'll seek those. Any other business members? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. So then, um, members, I, I know then we'll, we, we're coming to our forward work program and I refer members to the draft forward work program for the next four weeks, which is a tab 13.1 of the pack. And I also refer members to the extended draft forward work program, which is a tab 13.2. Would members be content that we consider the forward work program in closed session? Yep, members are content. So can I ask you, Clerk, then, to uh, take us out of broadcasting? Program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.